All right, looks like it's time to get started. Welcome to week three of information security systems and management. I'm looking forward to throwing this set of slides at you and walking through the discussion. So let me get uh, this started here. All right, presentation mode. Pull up my notes. Uh, you might hear a little bit of bassoon uh, in the background uh, practicing. Um, my son has a bassoon lesson on Zoom and it had to be rescheduled because of uh, time uh, conflict. So apologies um, for any uh, background bassoon practicing by a boy. There we go. Um, but you will uh, hopefully be able to hear me just fine um, as I go through the slides. All right, so let's see, uh, audio check uh, using the correct mic. Everything looks good. I'm pretty sure I'm presenting the right uh, slides. And so uh, let's get started. All right, so week three. This week we're discussing data classification. So data is the most valuable asset in most organizations these days. Creating data is enriched. Right, data is always enriched, uh, raw data, and then of course, um, enriched data, and it has business value. And it's the core reason for being for many organizations, the literal raison d'etre for technology-based companies at least. Uh, yes, there are still many product-based organizations that have physical access assets to protect, uh, but even a company like Tiffany & Co is essentially protecting their intellectual property of the designs for their jewelry and diamond settings, and not so much the diamonds themselves. Uh, and we cannot know how much security to wrap around an API or an application if we don't first agree with the business on the classification of the data. Uh, public, internal, confidential sensitive, or confidential restricted is the basic set of four that I've um, spoken about uh, before. So why, for example, put a $500 lock on a $20 bicycle? You would. All right, so let's talk. Uh, but before going into the details of data classification, let's first talk about a data centric security model. This as opposed to the traditional perimeter based security model. The more we understand data, the various types of data, and how data and code are created, maintained and deployed, the better we will be at our jobs of information security professionals. All right, the castle and the keep. A perimeter-based security model is now a decidedly legacy design. Data-centric security takes as its focus the protection of data where it lives. So there really is no, you know, DMZ is the battle, right? Um, it's been taken basically to every workstation, laptop, tablet, and mobile device, right? The battle has moved. Uh, no longer is it about the moat uh, around the castle with the walls uh, and the keep of the castle. Uh, and of course, the treasure chest inside of the keep inside the castle, uh, which has a lock on it and has the crown jewels. All right, let's start with a little bits of uh, what I call some inconvenient truths. Asset management is imperfect at best. Think about all of those you know, ephemeral VMs. Uh, the network is hard to define and protect. Essentially, we have to believe and, and act as if there's really just one network, the internet. Uh, there is no inside or outside. You need to have, uh, you know, uh, HTTPS everywhere, uh, even on intranet resources, uh, because of insider threat, uh, because of compromised assets, uh, supply chain attacks like we you know, saw with uh, SolarWinds, you have to assume that the adversary is inside your network. Uh, and then of course, one of the other inconvenient truths, every user is their own CIO. So regarding asset management, I mean, just think about those ephemeral VMs. I like to call them um, sometimes June bug VMs, uh, VMs that only live for a day or less potentially. And of course, there's uh, ephemeral containers, uh, elastic and auto scaling infrastructure. You might not even have time to scan an asset for vulnerabilities before it's killed or recycled. So long lived server instances are becoming a thing of the past. Soon enough, there will be actually no more server backups and server restores uh, as a BCP DR technique. Instead, we will just deploy fresh from the repository. And here I'm talking about deploying you know, hardened CIS images, for example, or your own golden image. You would just deploy a new patched image and deploy code to it. You can probably deploy a new server with code you know, inside of 15 minutes. I can't even imagine you can find the right backup to restore uh, within 15 minutes in many cases. Uh, so infrastructure as code is definitely contributing to our talent uh, and technique 
uh, at deploying infrastructure fresh. Uh, so no more security patching, no more reboots, uh, or maybe you need reboots, but for other reasons. Just deploy a new image and the security updates have already been applied. Yes, we need to manage persistent data and session information somewhere, but we've always had to do that. Right? It's not just uh, now that you, the underlying hardware has been sufficiently abstracted away from discrete servers of one, two, and four RU, uh, RU being an abbreviation for rack units. Uh, with, uh, of course, you know, dedicated physical number of cores, uh, dedicated memory, and dedicated storage. Now we have completely elastic and scalable. Uh, you can horizontally scale your servers um, by making them uh, more, right, so more nodes, uh, or you can vertically scale your servers uh, by reconfiguring them to have more resources, more memory, more CPU, uh, faster network interface. All right, let's see. On the topic of networks and boundaries, like inside and outside, uh, who wants to be an ISP for your workforce? So split tunnel routing uh, and VPNs are a bad idea. Split tunnel routing means when you open up the VPN, some of the traffic goes to the VPN and some of it goes straight out to the internet. And that's bridging the uh, networks between a corporate private network and uh, your home network, which could have all sorts of untrusted devices on it from the security point of view of the uh, com com corporation or company that you work for. Uh, so anyway, split tunnel routing is a bad idea, but not everyone wants to, uh, you know, have all the traffic go through the VPN um, you know, because that could be a, a lot of traffic um, uh, that they don't necessarily want to have to provision, right, on a network link into your office or into your data center. But some organizations, it does make sense to do that. Anyway, the days of building a corporate network and partitioning it off from the rest of the internet are coming to an end. Uh, some in some sectors more quickly than others, of course. Uh, and lastly, uh, every user is their own CIO. What this means is that they, they have a lot more control over what is installed on their devices and applications. Uh, plugins, web browser extensions, uh, modules for uh, various packages um, that uh, may be used. Let's say they're a developer and they're using NPM. You know, they can install modules and packages, hopefully from a repository that you control. But oftentimes, if they're doing development, they'll be pulling these Mac modules and packages uh, off of the internet. Uh, there was a really good article recently that I have to remember to pull up uh, about uh, the hacker who uh, figured out that you could actually rename some of these modules that are used in private repos uh, and put out a public version and just increment the version and it was automatically being sourced. And so it was a supply chain attack, a very novel approach to a supply chain attack uh, to be able to uh, execute arbitrary code uh, just by saying that your version of a particular module or package is one higher uh, than the one everyone else is using. Uh, and of course, this was a security researcher that declared what they were doing and uh, put in a readme that said this is not an actual you know, application code. This is part of his research. I think Sonatype um, published a blog post about that as well, because they're in the business of uh, providing um, uh, a repository and artifacts uh, for your build environments and automatic deployment and managing that uh, and maintaining the latest stable and secure versions of those packages. Uh, and then of course, yeah, let's see, that has been the case of the past. Um, so let me uh, move forward here, evolves thinking. So for every action, there is an equal and opposite user reaction. The danger lies in what you don't know or what we don't know. Uh, work is not a location. Uh, work happens everywhere, right? It used to happen in the office. Now work happens at home, work happens, you know, when you're traveling or when you're on temporary, uh, you know, uh, housing uh, for the pandemic, uh, visiting family, um, spending time in Florida, staying away from the cold weather. What else? Let's see. Oh, and of course, complexity is the enemy of security. So like water flowing downhill, data will always find a way to get where it's needed or leak through the area where it's least protected. Users will find ways around our security controls and tools. Edward Snowden made this extremely clear with his extraction of data from the NSA bunkers in the Hawaii Cryptologic Center, uh, the HCC. Uh, these particular bullets uh, on the left here, they're actually borrowed from former CTO and uh, of GE, uh, Larry uh, Biagini, uh, no, sorry, Biagini, yeah, Biagini. Uh, he had a presentation at a security dinner, dinner that I attended um, a while back, and he pointed out that we really have to focus on the user experience and not just on the security. Uh, we need to solve business problems in a secure fashion and not just put up uh, roadmaps uh, and bumps uh, along those roadmaps uh, where security concerns uh, are being uh, addressed, hopefully. So uh, again, those uh, evolved thinking 
from his point of view was that for every security action, there is an equal and opposite user reaction. So understand what those reactions are to your designs and your security architectures. Uh, for example, forcing people to make you know stronger and longer passwords often uh, encourages them to just simply write them down, uh, which is not a good security practice and outcome. And so make sure that you know your policy doesn't actually inspire a less secure behavior than what you were trying to actually fix with your policy. Uh, the danger lies in what you don't know, of course, and that means assume you don't know and have tools that are doing discovery scans. Uh, there's plenty of uh, tools that are able to discover infrastructure that shows up on your AWS account or in your cloud or on your on-prem data center. Just scanning IP addresses, um, vulnerability management uh, with a scanner appliance, for example, is a good way to run discovery scans just to make sure that you're aware of when an interface, you know, a network address uh, shows up on a new device. Let's say, for example, a developer is working on a web server, a development web server, and they want to test a new instance of something without taking down the old one. They might, for example, bring up a new IP address on the machine from a DHCP range uh, or looking at a network um, you know, management uh, tool, find an, an available IP address, bring it up, put it on port 8000, you know, maybe 8080 or just port 80 or 443 itself. And you can discover this potentially by running discovery scans. Uh, so make sure you, you have very little that you don't know about that's running on your infrastructure. And then, of course, this work is not a location. That was very prescient um, when I heard him say it. I think it was probably maybe November, December 2019 when that security dinner happened uh, where he was speaking. I'm pretty sure it was a uh, Zscaler event. Um, but anyway, I think he's on the board of uh, directors for Zscaler now. But anyway, a really brilliant um, CTO who had a lot of problems to solve um, well ahead of his time with his thinking on these things. And of course, complexity is the enemy of security. Another way of saying that would be keep it simple, stupid, right? KISS, uh, the KISS principle. Uh, the more simple you can make things, the more secure you can make them. All right, so let's restate the problem. If perimeter-based security is, losing, is a losing proposition because there's really only one network, the internet, then what seemed like an execution problem in information security is actually a design problem. So from this realization comes a change in perspective, a gestalt change. Uh, the German word gestalt is interpreted as pattern or configuration. Used in terms of perspective change, I like to refer to the duck and rabbit drawing shown here. Uh, the ink on the page remains the same, but now we see a rabbit where once we could only see a duck or, or vice versa. And you cannot see it as both at the same time. So sometimes when we're trying to understand something in a new way, we might not need to see anything different, as in dots on the page, right? We can actually agree on the facts. Maybe those are the dots on the page, or at least we hopefully can agree on the facts of the matter. But it's actually in the interpretation and meaning that changes when you have a, a perspective change or a gestalt shift. We change. Our perception or our perspective changes. All right, so what does this mean for leadership? Um, the CISO is not equal to the Department of No and the keeper of controls and audits, uh, but instead the CISO must embrace enablement and risk management, uh, risk reduction, risk mitigation, uh, and risk transfer. Information security, in my mind, should be an advisor to the business and not uh, a Department of No. To summarize risks and present options based on our knowledge as infosec information security professionals, and then allow the business to decide what course to take. Um, or perhaps instead of saying no, instead say not right now, and then explain what the risks that need to be addressed are or mitigated before something new or innovative can happen or be deployed. Uh, procure observability for your cloud services. Uh, a CASB, um, a cloud access security broker, uh, is, it can help. Uh, NetFlow-based alerts, they can help. Um, sophisticated IAM, Identity and Access Management, is one of the most powerful investments for security, along with the password vault, of course. And we spoke about um, IAM and the different levels of maturity last week. Uh, work on your risk register every month and track ownership back to the business so that they are empowered to make evidence-based risk assessments and determine the business appetite for risk. You cannot hope to build a world of prevention uh, but we can still strive for it, of course. Uh, but instead, we need to create a world of efficient detection and response, automated, scripted, and robust. Uh, in terms of risk, I also wanted to mention uh, a couple of dimensions of risk uh, that cyberspace brings. 
So we have our uh, physical, right? Uh, physical risk physical security, uh, physical hardware. And in my mind, the virtual servers and systems and containers and things that run on that physical are also dependent on the physical security as well. Uh, so software um, and virtual servers, physical servers, I kind of lump that all into uh, physical uh, risk and the physical aspects. Uh, then comes uh, informational risk. Uh, so thinking about things like data at rest and data in transit, uh, these are more important than the systems themselves, because what is at the heart of people processing tools, you know, the data, uh, right, and data classification. And so in this case, uh, informational, um, the informational dimension uh, is the second. And then the third one, which is often overlooked, and I think it could be called cognitive risk uh, or systemic risk in some cases. Uh, think about the analogy to systemic racism and systemic risk. In the instance of systemic racism, we're talking about an institution that over years and years uh, has sort of built up uh, tacit rules, rules that are not written down, but that are observed by the institution. So you could potentially have a police force full of non-racist people, right? Non-racist police officers. They could be people of color, they could be women, they could be you know, all sorts of people. Uh, but the institution itself could potentially have systemic racism still imbued in it from this long legacy and history of treating everyone unequally. And so that's one of the definitions in my mind of racism is not just prejudice, but it's power plus prejudice. And so these institutions and who controls them uh, has an influence and a life of its own almost. And so when I talk about systemic risk and systemic um, and cognitive risk, uh, these are the sort of the perceptions, um, attitudes and behaviors and preferences of people uh, to address a particular security risk uh, or to ignore it and to not pay attention to it. Uh, take, for example, the water treatment plant uh, that was uh, hacked in Florida recently, uh, Oldsmar, uh, in Pinellas, I think it was, County. So this was uh, in the news and it was quite scary that the systemic risk was that everyone knows that critical infrastructure is, is understaffed and under-resourced. So what was the, the, the facts of the matter? You know, what was the, the ink on the page? The ink on the page is that they were running Windows 7, which was end of life, January 2020, so over a year ago. They had installed TeamViewer on it for remote, remote access. Um, and they had this server that controlled these uh, water treatment facility uh, applications uh, on the internet uh, with a password that was shared among users, probably not rotated for that fact. And um, that that password was probably part of a breach data set that you could easily access on the dark web. Uh, so this was not really a hack in my mind because if you're violating those fundamental principles of running outdated OS that doesn't have security updates, you're putting it on the internet with a remote access viewer and shared account, right? It's not like a named individual is logging in. Uh, you're setting yourself up for that kind of a headline. Uh, but of course, I don't always want to blame and we shouldn't blame the victims. Uh, they were probably asking for, you know, um, better tools, uh, a Windows 10, you know, uh, update to the workstation and a firewall to put in front of it. So it could be accessed from the internet without appropriate VPN credentials or some type of zero trust configuration that allowed them in. Uh, but we'll be talking about that more uh, as we go through the lecture today. But I did want to mention, you know, that uh, that uh, Florida uh, hack and some of the details around it. All right, what next? Uh, what does this mean for the leadership in the CIO? Uh, this data centric versus perimeter based um, data classification and approach to security. Uh, the CIO should be technology first. Um, it should, sorry, should not be technology first, uh, but it's instead become business first. Uh, there must be growth, right? And the CIO has to support the growth of the business and not restrict it, right? And uh, it's not just growth for the sake of growth, uh, but it should be meaningful growth with a capital G. Uh, growth is often directionless at first, uh, but it's also a cumulative process by which an individual and all natural things develop holistically. Uh, for John Dewey, for example, uh, an American philosopher in the School of Pragm Pragmatism, uh, somebody that I did my master's thesis on at Stanford, uh, for John Dewey, growth was the telos of all natural life. Uh, in this way, education for Dewey is, is not merely a means to knowledge or work, uh, but it's a direct means to the purpose of life. Uh, telos is a, is a noun meaning the ultimate object. Uh, think of like telescope, uh, it has the word telos in it as well. Um, looking uh, at the ultimate object uh, uh, with a scope, right? Um, uh, through uh, you know, a lens, I guess. And uh, of course, the aim or purpose of a thing, right? That is the telos. Uh, so what is the telos of a water treatment control plant? Well, obviously to control the treatment of water. And what happened in the hack 
Well, it was completely out of control. The only reason that um, it was sort of stopped and, and they were aware of it is because the operator happened to notice that like the mouse was moving around the screen. And you know, that's horrible. Uh, I mean, I guess it's lucky because if they had had a more sophisticated remote management tool, uh, the operator may not have even seen, right? The screen and the mouse moving. Uh, they might have been using um, what? Uh, you know, a remote access um, technology that was started at a separate shell or a separate connection that wouldn't have even been on display uh, for the operator to observe and to shut it down. Of course, there are additional controls in play to stop it. I think it was um, the uh, sodium hydroxide levels went from 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. And, uh, you know, maybe it was a, a malicious attack. Maybe it was just a bored kid that was wondering what they could do with something um, and accessing it uh, because they had the tools and the means available. So legacy and heritage environments, of course, like these have to die. Uh, and technical debt is not just about technology. There's additional aspects to technical debt that we'll be talking about um, in, this, uh, in this lecture. All right, and so what does this mean for leadership for the CTO? This, this new perspective, this uh, un inconvenient truths that we went through uh, and these new perspectives and observations from uh, from uh, Biagini. So uh, the CTO is not the architect of corporate networks, but instead should be a multi-cloud advocate. More and more infrastructure is being outsourced to cloud service providers, and you're not going to be able to run all of your stuff in one cloud. Uh, Microsoft's going to have their piece. Google may have theirs. Um, Amazon, Oracle, all sorts of cloud service providers might be a part of it. Uh, most companies, actually, if you drill down, are multi-cloud at this point as well. Um, not just hybrid, private, public cloud, but multi-cloud provider. And what actually is multi-cloud? Well, the term in play, it, like I said, it used to be public and private cloud uh, or hybrid, uh, but that doesn't really cut it anymore. Multi-cloud is like having Azure, Google, AWS, and Oracle all making up your business application landscape. Uh, and the way I characterized some of these uh, cloud players uh, was that for Azure, uh, and Microsoft, it, it was force and coercion. You'll never open another spreadsheet again if you don't buy some of our cloud, right? That's Microsoft's force and coercion to use at least some of their cloud, Office 365, um, Exchange Online, things like that. With AWS, uh, I characterize them as being the first mover advantage and they're still ahead, uh, but they have demonstrated that they are not too big to fail um, because they've had some outages recently. Uh, self-inflicted S3 outage a couple of years ago um, and uh, other other outages, I think if I remember correctly, uh, when, when Azure, or sorry, when AWS goes down, a good portion of the internet does as well because of concentration risk because everyone's running everything in, in the US East, uh, which you shouldn't do. You should spread things out a bit, right? And Google, uh, as a Google, as a cloud service provider at least, um, I, I characterize them as kind of constantly wondering why everyone doesn't use their stuff since it's superior technologically um, and, and has they really haven't learned how to sell to enterprise google hasn't um, because they're just so smart right and they don't know how to sell to enterprise because you have to dumb down that smartness in order to be a successful salesperson and to sell to enterprise level buyers and so google's you know like i said scratching their head saying like, why doesn't everyone just use our stuff it's so much better uh, than what's going on you know in aws or in azure uh, think of Google, for example, as having this massive um, digital fiber network on their backbone. You don't have to pay transit costs to sync data from one Google data center to another. And this is global. Uh, with AWS, you do, right? You pay egress um, and transit costs on data between you know, US East and US West, for example. So if you want to, and you have a business that requires you to have data, it's much more local, but replicated, right? Um, read, write volumes and uh, databases and tables. Uh, you're gonna be paying a lot in bandwidth to shovel that data around. But if your business is highly local, as in just national, you know, to the US and maybe even to one region in the US, uh, you can certainly go with AWS and just go with multiple availability zones. I think they have like six of them or so within US East. Uh, US East one is like, you know, Virginia, um, and uh, they have one A, one B, one C, one D, one E, probably F and G as well. I'm not sure exactly, I haven't looked lately. But anyway, and then they have US East 2, which is Ohio, uh, which would save you from you know, a flood uh, or a hurricane taking out um, you know, Virginia data centers. Uh, but anyway, uh, and then Oracle. How do I characterize Oracle? Uh, I, I think they're playing catch up. Uh, Oracle has maybe five, 6% uh, market share of the cloud. 
And if they can double their market share in the next you know, year or two, or over the last couple of years, everyone's going to get big bonuses, right? Because I mean, doubling market share would be huge, but it would still only be about 10, 15, 12% market share. But they have been, like I said, playing catch up. Um, they've uh, tried to leapfrog some of the basic um, you know, specs uh, of a data center uh, node and infrastructure and design. And uh, they started pinching uh, talent from AWS and Azure very aggressively uh, to build up their OCI, right? Oracle um, Cloud Infrastructure. And so they've launched, is it, I think it's called OCI 2.0. And one of the things that they did was, for example, to go to a 25 gigabit ASIC. Um, these are the fundamental chips inside of the network interfaces. So remember we had, you know, 10 megabit, one gigabit, uh, and then 10 gigabit networking. So now a 25 gig network is kind of this ASIC that's taking over. Uh, and then you can do multiples of that, right? 25, 50, 75, you know, um, 100. And so that's one of the things they're doing, but not everyone needs a 25 gig interface. Uh, so I think some of their workloads obviously are, are playing to certain you know, on-prem uh, Oracle data workloads that are gonna be some of the last workloads to move out of um, on-prem and proprietary data centers and into the cloud. And so they will definitely have an aspect of, uh, um, you know, playing catch up. And uh, the one other thing that they did, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but they had a pretty clever marketing approach to getting people ready for the cloud, even if they weren't ready to pull the trigger and start running their workloads in the cloud. They came up with this concept of, um, what was it called? A cloud at customer. And so what they did was, you know, they would provision you uh, the the orchestration stack uh, that you would get if you ran an Oracle Cloud. So think of um, an InfiniBand uh, backend network on a, um, what are they called? Um, uh, Oracle um, Terra data, I think they were called um, servers. And, um, and no, sorry, Exadata. And so let's say you have like a rack or a, a, a half rack of, of Terra um, Exadata servers. Uh, and infrastructure, and it's all in a band connected. So that means like fiber optic level connection speeds between it, between the storage arrays and the back plane for the network. They would put you on all of their orchestration tools. And the only thing you would be lacking at that point would be the elasticity or the auto scaling aspect, right? You can't just magically have a second rack or a third rack worth of Exadata show up in your data center uh, and expand and contract your workloads, you know, and your compute infrastructure uh, dynamically. Uh, but you would at least get onto the orchestration components and have all the stack. That's why they called it cloud at customer. And eventually when you do get, you know, the information security officer's permission and the legal team's permission to move that, you know, legacy Oracle on-prem, you know, database, you know, the ones with the white knuckle grip, you know, that the team says, no, we're never going to run this in the cloud. Well, eventually they do and will. Uh, and that's when they make the transition more easily. So I really like this idea they had of um, cloud at customer to get people onto at least the orchestration and tooling that they're going to have eventually and make it less painful when they do pull that trigger. Uh, and of course, remember that work is no longer a location. It's not a physical place for many workers these days. Um, certainly all of us, uh, you know, now we're in the pandemic. Uh, but think about like what was happening with WeWork and FlexSpace uh, prior to the pandemic. WeWork's, you know, um, market was going through the roof. You know, they were taking all this high uh, end um, real estate up and filling it with, you know, temporary and flex workers. Uh, and it came, you know, very permanent fixtures of business, right? So that they could lower their um, sunk costs on, on office space and yet still be able to sort of um, flexibly add and remove uh, workers, you know, to the payroll uh, without having that burden of, of, of real estate. And so WeWork was an incredible model, you know, going into the pandemic now, not, not so much maybe, um, but I'm sure they'll eat up a lot of the available inventory that's out there now uh, with temp space uh, that happened from all the businesses that uh, basically shut down or, or went bankrupt. Uh, work from home, of course, dictates that we bring the security controls to the data and to the endpoints, to the laptop. So you need roaming DNS firewalls. You need, you know, policy that can be implemented uh, in a distributed network, not behind this perimeter-based approach um, that we've always been trying to protect and defend in the past. All right, so we should be finishing up the bassoon lesson um, in another minute. I apologize for that. Hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, all right, so technical debt. Your platform has technical debt. Even a one-year-old startup has technical debt. Decisions, essentially, that were made, um, but they were deferred, the impacts of them were deferred until later. Uh, choices that were not future-proof, but were rather quite expedient and of the moment. Uh, but there's also something I'd call organizational debt. 
and communications debt that contribute to the overall technical debt. So most of us are not getting out of the perimeter-based security model tomorrow. Uh, you're lucky if you're working in a company that's you know, born as a startup on the web in the cloud and not uh, having some kind of on-prem footprint. Uh, we have to move to that data-centric model and we have to transform the architectures of these businesses uh, that were you know, still using and are still using a perimeter-based security model. Uh, so what's in our way of doing that, from, from making that happen and making it happen quickly? Uh, technical debt. Yes, of course, there's you know, technical debt in the code itself, uh, but that's not all, right? It's not just about someone rewriting and refactoring the code to make it into a serverless or a Lambda you know, design uh, or making it uh, elastic aware so that it knows when there's more nodes you know, to farm the requests out to on the web layer, database layer, or middle uh, tier uh, application logic layer. And of course, technical debt is, is referred to when the code is hard to change and when it's potentially hard to deploy. Uh, some companies uh, do like a monthly deployment or a quarterly deployment. They have a, a waterfall development method methodology, right? They don't have um, a modern agile development, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment um, kind of approach. And as more modern frameworks and tools show up, like I mentioned, that technical debt starts to grow because it's the disparity between what's available as a, as a technique and what you're actually using right now within your company. Um, think of something like Etsy, which has, I think, what, thousands of deployments a day, uh, lots and lots of little deployments, uh, and it's very agile and they can be rolled back, they're very atomic, um, and uh, you know, for that, they can be very agile and very fleet-footed, agile with a lowercase a. Um, and they can spin and turn on a dime and change you know, direction and introduce new tools uh, with very little overhead, uh, very little friction, right? And that's an aspect of technical debt. And here, technical debt, you often think about there being like a lump sum, like $5,000 worth of technical debt or a you know, million dollars worth of technical debt. But uh, that doesn't capture it 100% either because technical debt can also incur what I would call a tax on transactions, the transaction of deployment, the transaction of build, deploy, and release. There can be a tax on those transactions because of your technical design choices or the ones that have been made before you joined. Uh, and it's, so it's not just a balance of deferred decisions or choices. Uh, and so I've got an article uh, in, the, in the lecture notes uh, that you can uh, read uh, if you're interested later uh, that talks about how technical debt isn't just technical. Uh, but I'm going to go into some of the aspects of that article in the next couple of slides. All right, uh, so a bit of searching for images related to technical debt produced this one. Uh, so let's look at this for a second. Uh, it illustrates a couple of important points. Our culture, our communications, and our design thinking result in quite different outcomes uh, with regard to technical debt. Uh, so let's see what we've got here. Let me hide this uh, notes for a second. Uh, so on the left, we have the technical debt. Obviously, the debt goes up on the uh, what is that, the Y axis? And um, I think that's Y. Uh, X is usually left, right? right? Uh, and then of course in time, you know, we have uh, the beginning where change is very easy and technical debt's very low. You can change anything that you did on day one or day two in a company, you know, with a lot, a lot of impact. Um, so they ascribe a dollar, you know, to the cost here. And then as time moves on, change becomes harder and uh, unrefactored code starts to get more and more expensive. Uh, so ten dollars in the middle, and then a hundred dollars, you know, kind of, you know, uh, almost um, unthinkable uh, tax on on changing that code, uh, and then of course refactored code um, has uh, less of a burden, right? There's uh, easier to uh, redo uh, as time goes on and you reach the end of the project, uh, because you know the sooner you decide to refactor, um, the less uh, you know impact and, and uh, hard and soft costs. Uh, be licensing costs, for example, switching between um, an Oracle database and uh, an open source, uh, you know, equivalent like Postgres. Um, there's a lot of switching costs involved, but oftentimes you can actually pay for like two or three years worth of um, of uh, development uh, on a new platform just by getting rid of those licensing costs. All right. So in the area of technical debt, I mentioned this phrase organizational debt. An organizational structure and its culture that hinders progress actually incurs technical debt. So think of a bureaucracy with a command and control culture, right? Something that feels very military top-down 
you know, just do it kind of uh, Nike epistemology is what I call it, the theory of knowledge, uh, where it's just do it. We told you to do it. We don't care. We don't want your opinion. You do what we tell you to do. And of course, uh, in this kind of organizational culture and structure uh, where you have these bureaucracies and, and you have very rigid hierarchy uh, instead of a matrixed organization when anyone can talk to anyone and people with good ideas can go and talk to a different department and you know, make those ideas happen, right? That's a very fluid kind of um, non-rigid uh, organizational structure. Uh, but anyway, these, these bureaucracies with this command and control culture, they often have a penchant for secrecy and silos uh, and keeping things, you know, very closely guarded, you know, play their cards close to their chest, um, as it's called. And that's an organizational structure that actually increases organizational debt over time because it's not open and fluid, you know, which is what we think of as um, you know, a much healthier organizational culture. And of course, these silos and this, this pension for secrecy and not sharing information between teams, um, that makes it very difficult to eradicate. Uh, it's important to note, though, that there can be, however, high functioning teams within a silo uh, that are working with actual low technical debt. Uh, they may not actually be aligned with the overall organizational culture. Uh, this is both a blessing and a curse if you're on one of those teams. Um, merging with the corporate culture might introduce friction uh, where none previously existed, for example. Uh, Microsoft, I think, published a paper recently, last year or two, uh, about the link between organizational structure and uh, what they were tracking as uh, post-launch defects, uh, essentially bugs. It turns out that organizational metrics are the strongest and most accurate predictor of bugs. Things like the number of engineers on a project, the percentage of the organization that contributes to a project's development, how many people can make decisions or have uh, positional authority, et cetera, uh, and, and not uh, the historically predictive models, uh, such as churn, code complexity, and dependency analysis. Uh, so this is a significant portion of technical debt, actually, is organizational structure and culture. And that's one of the reasons why I think I mentioned in some of the earlier lectures uh, that if we're here to affect change and to make the organizational culture more secure and, and better uh, thinking about security, we have to tackle the people in the processes. And again, you know, the mindset uh, just as much as we do uh, the actual tool set. Uh, let's see, and the uh, communications debt. So this is another aspect of technical debt, right? We had code and dependencies and refactoring. Uh, we have organizational aspects and now communications. So the communications contribution to technical debt is actually caused by a lack of healthy communication. And although communications debt is easier to root out, it's actually quite linked to organizational debt. Remember, if you have these rigid hierarchies where you know you can't talk to um, a, a VP, right? You have to go to this, you know, the, the senior VP uh, and then have it cascade down, or you can't talk to a senior manager, you know, manager to manager, uh, or even engineer to engineer between teams and silos in those rigid, you know, hierarchical organizations, then your communications uh, is going to incur friction and uh, inefficiencies uh, and technical debt as well, or contribute to the technical debt. I think it's uh, Conway's law that illustrates how the architecture of a code base is actually bound to be a mirror image of the communication structures that are set up by the organization that builds it. So think about that. The actual code base is kind of manifesting um, hierarchical shadows almost um, uh, from the actual communications org. Uh, so team membership and communication where those things are closed and where authority is formal and hierarchical then the work will tend to be monolithic code and architectures that are you know obviously difficult to change uh, code and architectures become difficult to change when the organizational structure and communications is messed up or at least i'm saying it's messed up uh, heck, even when the communication paths are open and inclusive they can still get fouled up um, and so if you have uh, you know structural impedance uh, and resistance to just healthy communication um, and even if those are open uh, just think of the, the telephone game, you know, shown here in this graphic, um, where the person that hears the message at the end, right, too much communication in between, even if it's open, can transmutate, you know, and, and change the message that was heard 
um, or at least yeah, the message that was heard versus the one that was spoken uh, by the original uh, person making the request, for example. And of course, the death of uh, waterfall development methodology and the replacement with Agile and Scrum uh, has sometimes been mis misinterpreted, actually, as the code is the documentation. Um, but there's a lot of other communication going on uh, that needs to be cared for uh, and paid attention to. Uh, not just, um, you know, uh, documentation about code. Uh, so let me check uh, as the lights go down and the sun sets. Um, sometimes I need to up the brightness a little bit here to uh, keep me from looking too dark uh, on the image. Although mostly you're looking at the slides, of course. Um, all right. So what are some of those other aspects of communication that we need to pay attention to uh, besides, you know, email and Slack? Uh, well, many different kinds of communication artifacts are in or are close to the software itself and also in our development, release and deployment systems and tools. So some are more verbose than others. Uh, so here's a great graphic that I found um, showing the, ver the, the matrix here of um, verbosity and terseness uh, and then, you know, not in scope. Um, sorry, things that are not in the source code repository at the bottom and the things that are in the source code repository at the top. So this is a bunch of software communication artifacts. If you want to have a healthy organizational culture and break down those barriers, uh, then make sure that all of these things exist and that uh, style guides communication focus is, is placed on all of them. Take, for example, a commit message uh, for a git hook, right, for a git commit uh, with a detailed description, right, don't just commit and assume anyone, you know, reading the commit later is going to know by looking at the code, right, remember the documentation is the code, no, not necessarily. I mean, it is, of course, uh, you can see what it's actually doing. But the idea here is that maybe you should require a JIRA ticket reference for a post commit hook um, at the very least, so that uh, the git commit is rejected if it doesn't follow the syntax of like project name dash and then you know two or three digit number uh, or four digit number if you've been doing a pretty long uh, project. Uh, that's a good way to enforce uh, good documentation artifacts within uh, your software deployment and development uh, system. Uh, I've put git commit hooks in as well that request that through like a regex uh, to make sure that you can't commit something without saying, well, who asked you to make this commit and where are the requirements and where's this our testing artifacts to show that it works and you know what was it all impacting anyway. Rather than having to suss it out by looking at the diff on the commit, uh, you can actually then just go to the JIRA ticket and see all of that information. Who approved it? You know, how long did it take to work on? Where did they test it? Are there any screenshots from the QA team that showed that it worked um, before it would be promoted to production? Uh, another place would be pull and merge request comments, right? Adding comments uh, is like leaving breadcrumbs for uh, uh, Hansel and Gretel to find their way back, you know, from that walk in the forest. Uh, and so that's what I think we need to do. Uh, when we help improve the communications culture and reduce technical debt, uh, we're injecting more documentation and comments, you know, into uh, all of these software systems. Uh, README files. Um, I often put a README worksheet uh, into all the spreadsheets that I make, uh, just because in the actual spreadsheet, you don't have any room for like hyperlinks and comments and you know, owner names and email addresses. And so I always put in a README tab uh, so that I leave that behind for others. Uh, so that they can find out like why was the spreadsheet created, who made it, um, you know, what are the you know, links, you know, that were related to the tools, you know, and the code base in the Git repo. Uh, these are again, you know, breadcrumbs for the next owners of the platform and the code uh, that will come after us. And of course, my first and only love, if you can't do all those other things, is a wiki, right? Um, a Confluence page or something, other internal living documentation. Uh, inspire that habit, uh, show it uh, with your security work, uh, infect other people on your team with this documentation instinct, with this documentation habit. Uh, and then lastly, of course, logging. Just make sure that you use critical warning, error, and info logging standards in your messages. And uh, if you don't have logs enabled and you're not logging messages, uh, then you're really failing uh, to make uh, you know, security events and incidents and failures uh, visible and you can't uh, protect what you don't know about. And if there's no logs, you can't even know that a service is failing or being attacked uh, or being you know, probed um, by uh, uh, malicious uh, actors. All right, so on to the heart now. And I've mentioned this a few times, so I'll just uh, throw it out there again. 
at least four basic common data classifications, uh, public, internal, confidential sensitive, and confidential restricted. All right, so now that we've discussed the perspective change, right, that gestalt shift, the rabbit duck diagram, and why we're doing it, uh, what we're trying to do to remove technical debt uh, and technical tax uh, or, uh, that on that that contributes to inefficiencies, um, and we're going to be adopting a data-centric security model. We can now move on to the discussion of data classification itself, and we're also going to be discussing data masking and uh, zero trust. All right, so in the public classification of data and any data that's classified as public, <coughs> this, uh, for example, be information and data that's found on a website, publicly available, unauthenticated pages. Uh, and it usually is classified as low confidentiality and low risk. This data and this information is meant to be shared and it often increases in value by being shared and copied. Uh, more examples uh, would include uh, press releases, once published, I think I mentioned how uh, pre-release um, access to press releases before they're published uh, is certainly a violation of uh, security and can materially impact the organization like what happened with Intel. Somebody accessed uh, their press uh, release by guessing the URL, I get, um, I'm pretty sure, uh, like an hour or two before the, or before the earnings call, and it had a huge effect on them. Uh, it lowered their stock value just because of, you know, someone accessing the press release um, that contained the information that was about to be spoken in like an hour later. Uh, and of course, social media posts, those are meant to be consumed, annual reports, things like that for publicly traded companies. Uh, remember that some data is bound for public classification, but it can be highly sensitive before being published. I think I talked about that once, once public. Once the data is public, though, what is the job of the information security team? Uh, well, for one thing, remember our AIC classifications, right? Uh, availability, integrity, and, and confidentiality. Uh, for apps and for the application data. The I stands for integrity, as you might recall, and how do you ensure that the facts remain fixed over time? Uh, how do you know that they're not overwritten or changed uh, in um, gross uh, or subtle ways? Uh, what about edit wars, for example, on various Wikipedia pages? Who made the change and why? Did they materially alter the narrative or description of an event or a person? I think you know, political entities on Wikipedia is a classic example. Uh, Barack Obama's page, you know, Donald Trump's page, you know, all sorts of people. Uh, fun way to spend some time. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention Wikipedia because um, this comic, uh, I think, is, is very funny. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you in case you can't see it too well. Um, so there's someone sitting at their computer desk to say, oh, wow. Well, Look at Wikipedia's talk page, right? There's talk pages as well where people talk about the content. Uh, for Star Trek Into Darkness, I have a new favorite edit war, right? I'm talking about these edit wars that happened, uh, if you're not familiar with them. And someone out of out of um, the panel says, oh. And uh, our, our narrator says, 40,000 words of debate over whether to capitalize into in the movie's title. And there's still no consensus. And the other person says, that's magnificent. And the other person says, it's breathtaking. Uh, they should have sent a poet. And so now the person's typing, well, I'm taking an executive decision. So this is apparently a Wikipedia editor you know, in this uh, comic. Uh, I hope both sides accept this as a fair compromise, type, 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 type. And so what you basically see is you know, mixed case, right? Um, every other character is capitalized. And of course, that's just silly, right? Is that a compromise? No, uh, but these kinds of things happen. Uh, many, many um, edit wars and uh, things around extremely OCD uh, trivia kind of stuff. Uh, and here I wanted to pause uh, the share and just do a little bit of a um, sidebar on, on how awesome Wikipedia is. And if you don't know it uh, as a consumer of information, which I presume you are, and I presume all or most of you, even if you're a, a student, uh, contribute maybe $5 or $2 a year to help keep Wikipedia going because it's just a phenomenal um, institution. And um, I was uh, living in Amsterdam when they came to Amsterdam for a hackathon. So they had a Wikipedia hackathon at a, you know, uh, what was it, uh, not a bed and breakfast, but a hostel uh, in Amsterdam. And there's only like 14, you know, 15 people that are the core of, of the Wikipedia. And then there's just these armies and troves of, of volunteers and uh, people that work on stuff. So I wanted to share with you a couple of links 
and I'm pretty sure I can cut out to it right now. And uh, you should be seeing uh, a link. Uh, and I'll throw this into the chat uh, for you so that you can see it um, right now as well. Bookmark it and take a look at it. So this is a, a Kafka link. Um, for the grafana.wikimedia.org. So the Wikimedia Foundation is the one that publishes the wiki software on which the Wikipedia was built. And they are so transparent and they are so open. Every piece of code, all of their puppet manifests, um, everything that they do, they actually publish uh, for free for everyone to see and stand on their shoulders and, and use the exact same configs, uh, maybe not identical configs, but certainly if you want to get to know what a massive Kafka, you know, consumer um, uh, you know, uh, message bus looks like, uh, go look at the, the, the Kafka that uh, Wikipedia has built, or the Wikimedia Org uh, Foundation. And so they're using Grafana to, to visualize this, but uh, you can see there's 145,000 messages per second coming in. Uh, and uh, that's like 37 megabits per second, you know, and this is just edits, right? Um, of this of the Wikipedias in, in various languages um, uh, around the world, and uh, over 80 megabits per second going out uh, over the Kafka uh, that they've built, and so that's just one link. Um, I presume uh, that this share that you're yeah you're looking at is that one good, and. Um, so this is great. I mean, you can look at the Varnish Kafka, right? Uh, Varnish is a caching layer. Uh, so the origin servers that make up uh, the Wikipedia um, don't have to serve as much data because uh, Varnish is caching it. And so these are, um, this one's the uh, Varnish Kafka. And so it looks like this one's pushing, you know, um, several thousand messages per second as well. You can see interesting spikes going on in here um, and different, uh, you know, cloud, uh, you know, uh, what are they called? Um, you know, publisher nodes um, and uh, consumer nodes. Uh, and then, you know, number of CPU seconds. And uh, anyway, so all sorts of stuff. You can look at different clusters. Um, you can look at uh, different sources, uh, event logging versus web requests. Uh, you can look at uh, Equiad, which is the data center in Virginia, I believe. Um, but other locations, um, you can look at uh, Equiad Prometheus operations. And just all of this stuff is available here. Uh, for you to look at and learn from, not just, you know, consuming the, the Grafana um, stuff. And if I jump back to my lecture notes, I think I have one other link that I prepared in here as well, um, or two of them actually. Uh, so let's jump to this one as well. Uh, so this one is wiki data dashboards, and this is showing um, edits, All right? So this shows live information about current edits happening on wiki data. Wikidata is a slightly different thing than the Wikipedia, um, but anyway, so this shows you know several hundred edits going on, um, you know per what I don't know what the unit of measure here is, um, uh, you know millions of, of edits, and some of them are being done by bots. Um, it's fascinating. I don't know if you've ever realized that the reason the Wikipedia is so good and consistent is because they have a culture of developing um, uh, Python robots uh, that go through and just fix you know mistakes, uh, inconsistencies. And they actually had a workshop at the hackathon in Amsterdam that I went to. And I actually wrote, wrote my own um, Python bot uh, to help improve the quality of Wikidata. I'm pretty sure what I ended up doing uh, was something on the order of you know, adding metadata to something that was a child of a parent um, data entity. So for example, all US cemeteries, um, there's you know, wiki pages and wiki Wikimedia, Wikipedia pages about all the cemeteries in the US. And so I went through all the ones in California and auto added metadata about them saying, yes, these should all be linked as a part of California and you know national or US um, cemeteries. And so it's, it's just basically enriching the metadata with a robot, um, but eventually it builds up the utility of that data and creates a resource you know, that we all can, can work from um, and benefit from. And so anyway, it's showing the different um, edit types over here uh, that are happening. So you have a, um, a uh, WB edit entity. Um, I guess that would probably be web, um, but I'd have to double check. Uh, and it's showing you know, the types of edits that are happening, uh, that are changing titles, that are changing links, uh, that are changing you know, redirects. Um, and then of course, the size of the changes has some interesting patterns showing up in it as well. And then a 30-day um, RC count 
um, and uh, edits per namespace. Um, you have uh, obviously lots of stuff going on in the Wikidata, since these are just Wikidata edits. I imagine you can find another dashboard, not just for um, Wikidata, um, uh, Wikibase, uh, Wikidata, maybe all of these are the Wikidata subsets actually, Wikidata quality. Um, but if you jump back up here to the Grafana homepage, uh, this is the one where you can just spend hours, uh, barely fascinating hours of work, uh, looking at um, how the how the how this top five web property is is held together uh, with just complete you know teams of, of volunteers. Uh, you can look at the MySQL data going on in the background, um, the Swift information. Like I said, the varnish traffic is pretty fascinating. We looked at that before, talking about gigabits per second of you know data that's being served, um, and uh, you know, these are the status what code two hundreds. Um, this is the legend, I guess, for it uh, for you to see what types of requests and and um, anyway, lots of uh, lots of interesting stuff there uh, under the Wikipedia and uh, um, Grafana data. They also have something uh, which I should probably pull up since I don't know that I'll do this aside before or again. Um, is well, it's not Jenkins. So what is it called? Um, uh, Garrett, that's right. So Garrett is a way of doing um, distributed um, code review. And so garrett.wikimedia.org. And this then hooks you up to the code, right? Because imagine you're a startup and you want to do really cool things and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So what you can do is you can actually volunteer or you know just wholesale you know take um, copies of their public repos. And so basically Garrett is showing all the code review that's going on and how they you know, farm it out, right? They don't have thousands of developers, you know, that keep the, the Wikipedia going. And so you can look at um, changes that are here in uh, the Garrett uh, instance. And uh, let's see, what would be another one? Um, remove unnecessary constraints, no. Um, enable random location feature. So if you click into one of these, you can see that they've got uh, automated checkouts um, and uh, robots that are parsing the code to see if it, um, you know, this Jenkins bot is doing a build. If the main build test fails, right, and that's the uh, integration uh, report, it took about three minutes for it to try to do the build. And these are the code bits that changed. And so if you click on it, it shows you, you know, all of the stuff um, that went into that edit and that build. And someone's basically contributing time, right? Volunteers is what keeps Wikipedia going. And uh, the Wikimedia org, you know, has all this incredible information uh, for you uh, and for us uh, to look at and understand, um, you know, what are some of the open changes that are in the queue, um, add MySQL updater. Uh, anyway, you can find all of the build and puppet um, master uh, configs that are used. This is like a test ge um, generator, some scaffolding that they're putting together on this project. Uh, so you can just basically jump uh, to the Git, um, you know, uh, repo and, and look at what they were working on and look at the diff and uh, find you know how it's supposed to be installed and of course if you want to gain some skills um, about how to do this then volunteer to help and you will be brought into the fold of people that uh, are contributing to this and it's a great way to get a leg up on the uh, experience uh, front where you don't get paid for it but you get the experience and then you can put that bullet on your resume and then when you go out for a job uh, interview you can say yeah i contributed to the wikipedia uh, foundation's uh, code base and learned how you know to use some of the excellent tools that they're doing there. Uh, so you can see here, this person's you know from cscott.net. Maybe he has his own domain, or she. I imagine it's probably a he. But uh, anyway, and you can look at uh, like I said, you can look at Garrett and the code base and all the different projects that are being used on here. How do they do analytics? How do they do data warehouse? Um, maybe that one was archived. But uh, um, anyway, that's one little bit of. Uh, Uh, make it harder for the security people working. No, uh, transparency is a great uh, element of security. Obviously, the details uh, and configs um, have to be kept secret, right? You don't put passwords into your code. Um, but the fact that your code is transparent, right? It's like uh, open source, you know, Linux kernel. It makes the kernel more secure. Yes, bad guys can go in and try to find, you know, vulnerabilities uh, and code comments that maybe give away that, you know, certain things uh, are kind of wonky and could fall over. Um, but 
that's how you make them stronger, right? Uh, it's not security through obscurity, uh, it's security through transparency. And so I think it's important to know that, uh, um, yeah, we're all in a good place uh, when we contribute uh, to the collective wisdom. We can all stand on the shoulders of these wiki uh, giants uh, and just do things at scale, right? Uh, based on their experience and years of, of time, you know, refactoring all this code. I'm pretty sure, what was it? Move back to the US in 2013. I'm guessing that the hackathon was probably in 2011 or 2012. And uh, they had just finished refactoring all the code and paying that price, you know, and getting it off of, you know, PHP and, and maybe there's some still some PHP out there, but basically um, getting it into Puppet, right? And making it um, configuration management and consistent and, and that enabled them to grow and build uh, even further. So anyway, that's one of the little asides um, in terms of uh, transparency and, and data classification, talking about, you know, those edit wars. All right, let's move on to internal. Uh, the internal data classification. The usual example mentioned for internal data is email. Uh, some emails are more sensitive and confidential, but in general, the day-to-day -day communications and exchange of information between employees and companies is classified as internal. Uh, disclosure of most of this kind of information is not terribly damaging uh, the reputation uh, to your reputation or your brand. Uh, more examples would include voicemail messages, uh, training materials, SOPs, uh, standard operating procedures, uh, address books, things like that. So that's internal. Uh, this is the beginning uh, of the application of the C in the AIC triad, uh, where confidentiality begins to play a role in the design of the application or service. Another aspect to consider is the aggregation effect. Um, and I think I mentioned this last uh, week as well one or two public records mixed with a few internal records can combine to become business sensitive. Uh, just as two medium vulnerabilities can be combined in an attack uh, to equal a critical vulnerability, right? Uh, the combinatorial effect uh, and, and what's called inference uh, for uh, inference risk in data sets, uh, which is something that needs to be considered as well. So just making public data machine readable or exposed uh, via an API or anonymized and masked uh, can actually change its sensitivity or confidentiality because of the possibility of doing inference. Uh, so let's say that you have you know, um, cancer data and you don't wanna give away the names of the people that have cancer, but if the population is small enough or if it's merged with large enough other data sets, uh, you can potentially find out you know, who uh, has cancer by taking you know, this anonymized data for the state of, you know, I don't know, let's pick a state, um, you know, uh, Mississippi or something, and you combine that with other data sets, you can actually create inference um, and aggregate data that it becomes more granular than the sources, the two sources that you used. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in the next couple of slides. Uh, machine learning and AI are increasingly used in more sophisticated analysis of what's called unstructured data. While the quality of the training data for algorithms is often found to be biased. Um, think, for example, of facial recognition, you know, working for all of those uh, white male programmers in Silicon Valley and Facebook and Google and Microsoft, uh, as opposed to you know, the rest of the world. Uh, so there's also actually security risks that are created uh, by machine learning models. Training a neural net, for example, can result in what's called overfitting. I don't know if any of you have taken any AI classes, but um, you know, models uh, in AI and training have to do with fitting the data and fitting the model. So when you talk about overfitting, uh, this is where attackers can infer membership of a data sample, as in it's a member of a sample of data, uh, by using machine learning in their attack. So the goal of this attack is to determine if a sample of data was used in the training data set of a machine learning model or not. So specifically, um, we look into tasks of, let's say, image classification uh, or sentiment analysis. Uh, so the first time, because of this, you know, this concept of adversarial AI, uh, we look into tasks of, um, you know, like I said, image classification. Physical objects can actually now be used for cyber attacks. Um, example, an AI attack can, can, can transform a stop sign in image recognition algorithms uh, into a green light in the eyes of a self-driving car. Um, by simply placing a few pieces of tape on the stop sign itself. Uh, and I'll 
show you a more detailed example of what I mean, because uh, this takes a little while to sink in. Um, but you can actually turn physical objects into cyber attacks. Uh, so data can also be weaponized in new ways using these attacks, uh, requiring changes in the way that data is collected, stored, and used for AI and, and training models for the data. Uh, here, perhaps, probably a good idea to throw open uh, this quick link. Um, this is in the lecture notes as well. So membership inference attacks uh, on neural networks. Throw it into the chat in case you don't want to have to wait uh, to look this one up yourself as well. Um, so this was one of the articles that I found um, when I was looking this up uh, a while back uh, and talking about popularity of machine learning and neural networks and uh, inference attacks. So the training set included all of these dogs and cats and rabbits and fox and sherpas and bunnies and things. And so is this dog, right, um, going to match, right? Or what, what are the ones that fall out of the data set? And so basically it talks about membership inference. And if you only have a black box access to the target model, to the training model, um, there are you know, limitations to what can be done, but the attack can still work. And so this is some of the um, you know, uh, ideas uh, that I wanted to hear. And you can see that's where I nabbed this uh, graphic from. Um, but anyway, so uh, back to the notes. So inference uh, with public data sets as well as uh, inference of um, training data. Uh, and then there's another one uh, using artificial intelligence uh, to attack AI as well, so adversarial AI. And I think NYU has a really great program that I'll make a quick pitch for, uh, which is called co-opting AI. So how do we get ahead of this uh, fact that there's bias in the data sets? Um, and sometimes it's uh, racist bias uh, for facial recognition and uh, constantly tagging faces uh, as criminals just because they have dark skin. Uh, bad training data in the AI, right? Police systems that are using these. Um, a lot of governments and cities are stepping away from it, like San Francisco, uh, and making sure that they're not using AI to do racial profiling, essentially. All right, so now let's move on to confidential sensitive. I'll get back um, to this uh, AI uh, in one more slide. So for confidential sensitive here, we're, we're typically talking about semi-sensitive data, such as compensation information for employees, uh, their home address. This information needs to be protected from unauthorized access, but the divulgence of which would not really cause serious repercussions for the business and its ability to con continue operations in a trusted and secure manner. Um, more examples include uh, strategy presentations, uh, roadmaps. These would be classified as confidential sensitive. Uh, referring back to week one, if we talk about secrecy, confidentiality, and privacy again for a minute. Um, secrecy refers to the effect of the mechanism used to limit the number of principles, right, the number of individuals uh, who can access information. Confidentiality, uh, you have an obligation to protect some other person or organization's secrets if you know them. And privacy is the ability and or right to protect your personal information. Uh, so question, what should be the data classification for a database that contains a mix of internal and confidential sensitive data? Well, the answer is confidential sensitive. Uh, since we have to take the classification for the most sensitive data, if more than one type of data is available in that application or data set. Uh, so instead of least common denominator, you take the highest uh, common multiple. Uh, most of the data classified as uh, confidential sensitive is going to be protected by MFA, right? Multi-factor authentication. Uh, you don't want just one factor between you and that sensitive data. Uh, HR systems like you know ADP or Workday, um, you know, SAP, things like that. For example, they should have SSO single sign-on uh, with MFA enabled, multi-factor auth. So you need to have one of those you know application calculators to get into them, uh, or app authenticator apps. Financial systems like Concur and accounting software tools, these are also a no-brainer for SSO plus MFA because the data is confidential sensitive or potentially higher. But we need to be careful about, we need, we need to be careful about what additional authentication factor to employ. Facial recognition systems, for example, are proving to be vulnerable to attack by AI in ways that are sometimes confusing to us humans and sometimes invisible. So adversarial AI is the application of AI in compromising the security controls uh, being used to protect people and data and, and locations. So shown here are three images of individuals wearing what are called fooling glasses. 
uh, and below the people that the facial recognition systems thought that they were. Uh, so these random kind of color segments and shapes uh, on these glasses uh, are, are fooling, you know, the AI uh, into m deciding or, you know, showing, you know, making you think that um, it's someone that's not actually in the picture. So I could see this in a cool TV episode, right, where someone goes and calculates, you know, and prefabricates, you know, a set of these glasses that don't probably even have lenses in them uh, to go and fool facial recognition to get through. But I think people wouldn't buy it. Right, they're they're used to having like a Mission Impossible complete, you know, latex face covering that makes you look exactly like that person, instead of something that just fools you know, fools facial recognition. Uh, so here I can pull out the uh, Verge article that I got this um, snapshot from. This was an article I think yeah 2017, and is it? Yeah, here it comes. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, Magic AI. These are the optical illusions that trick, fool, and flummox computers. And so this was the image that you saw there where they're being, you know, tagged as uh, people that they're not. And uh, anyway, this one's a fun one to read. Uh, again, I throw it into the chat for you to bookmark and uh, check out later. All right, back to the notes. Another aspect of AI and machine learning with regard to identity management is deep fakes. Uh, you've probably heard about this, right? Uh, deep fakes is a combination of deep learning and fake, uh, which are synthetic media in which a person in an existing image or video is replaced with someone else's likeness. Uh, while the act of faking content is, is not new, deep fakes leverage powerful techniques from machine learning and artificial intelligence to manipulate or generate visual and audio content with a high potential to deceive. Uh, the, main, the main machine learning methods used to create deepfakes are based on deep learning and involve training uh, generative neural network architectures, uh, such as autoencoders and uh, generative adversarial networks, um, GANs uh, as they're called. Deepfakes have garnered widespread attention for their use uh, in celebrity pornographic videos, uh, revenge porn, fake news, hoaxes, and of course, financial fraud, uh, where they generate a voicemail message of your CEO or CFO leaving a message uh, on uh, what's called uh, vishing, right? Uh, voicemail phishing, uh, where you leave a message on a voicemail that says, you know, please wire transfer you know, $10 million to the Cayman Islands, right? That's my favorite example um, from having worked in hedge fund, uh, where that's one of the, uh, you know, interesting attack uh, surfaces that we have to uh, guard against, right? Someone with the authorization or convincing someone with the authorization to do that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, so this has elicited uh, responses from both industry and government uh, to detect and limit their use. Uh, shown here is a demo of something called Avatarify uh, with the likeness of Elon Musk. Uh, it's primitive, um, but I'm sure the technology is gonna advance rapidly. Uh, so let me uh, play this clip and see if uh, it plays as expected. Oh wait, but I think I need to do um, sharing uh, with, uh, sorry, let me pause. Um, sharing with audio turned on. So new share, share sound, share video clip, back it up. All right. Then have a nice day, thank you. Uh, wait a second. Somebody is trying to connect uh, to our conference. Um, okay. Who? Who is it? We don't know. Uh, one second. <laughs> um, um, hey guys. Uh, hey. Uh, I Elon Musk. <laughs> yes. It uh, looks like I got into the wrong conference in Zoom. How are you doing, guys? <laughs> Uh, good. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm nice. Thank you. Nice, nice hair color, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's Elon. I'm well. Then have a nice day. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. 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 Have a nice Elon. day. <laughs> right. So, um, like I said, kind of easy to detect that particular um, uh, deep fake. Um, but this is the video uh, that they had posted uh, on their um, uh, website on uh, Avatarify. So I can pull that up for you real quick. 
And you can play around with this as well. Um, I think they have an example of Mona Lisa in here. Um, who's going to believe Mona Lisa joined a Zoom call? Um, but uh, definitely cool AI-based uh, technology uh, to help us uh, understand these new attack um, vectors, right? And how AI is being used uh, to create deep fakes in audio as well as uh, in video. All right. Uh, last, we reach uh, confidential restricted. So this is the most sensitive form uh, or classification for data uh, in our data centric um, data classification lecture. This classification includes super sensitive information where the exposure to unauthorized parties or individuals would generate serious repercussions with regard to brand damage, loss of trust and possible legal peril. Uh, social security numbers and PCI, payment card industry data is included in this category. Multi-factor authentication, three factors and greater sometimes uh, are often applied to protect this information from unauthorized access. So think of like a client side certificate, um, secret questions, um, uh, one time pad, you know, OTP um, calculator, uh, authenticator for the second factor, plus a username and a password. So now that we've reached the pinnacle of the data classification pyramid, uh, there's not a lot more to add with regard to the data centric security model. Uh, row level database access controls. Uh, this is actually possible, um, but they're expensive to implement. Uh, think of having a sensitive database. You don't want to have to encrypt all of the data in it, right? Because uh, it can be expensive to decrypt it. Just to even do a search, you would have to decrypt all of the fields that are encrypted. So if you have column level encryption, you could pick particular fields that are encrypted. And that would still be quite expensive if you have a lot of rows in your database. Imagine millions of records. Uh, so the idea of doing row level access controls um, is, is even better because then it's just specific records uh, and specific fields for those records that would be encrypted. Um, things like Salesforce, for example, have these capabilities. Uh, you have to pay more for them, uh, but encryption uh, significantly uh, increases you know, the cost. Uh, let's see, encryption of database fields and other sensitive data incurs, uh, it incurs a performance penalty when you need to search or sort, or otherwise query large numbers of records with encrypted fields. Uh, data models are reviewed and discussed by many organizations in response to the creation of GDPR, right, the European Data um, Governance uh, Laws. Data breach disclosure requirements and the associated penalties, these are some of the primary motivations behind um, large scale system refactoring, changing your data model putting the restricted data in its own set of tables uh, and not just mingling it all together and keeping it unencrypted. Uh, data masking. So this is an important technique uh, related to uh, how you can move uh, confidential sensitive data and confidential restricted out of production and into non-production. So this is called a downwards refresh. Uh, you you want to mask that data so that when it's played around with in QA and dev and, and integration environments, uh, the sensitive data is not there. So you can have relaxed, more relaxed controls around access to a QA environment, uh, taking away a CAPTCHA on login, for example, because there's no sensitive data on the other side because you've masked it. So take a social security number as just becoming, you know, a bunch of um, asterisks or X's and then only the last four digits uh, are used, you know, for parsing in order to understand uh, how the system performs. Uh, credit card numbers, the first six uh, or the last four digits um, are the maximum number of digits to be displayed uh, according to PCI DSS, right? So the payment card industry has guidance around how to do data masking for credit card numbers. Only personnel with legitimate business need can then see the full data. So this is talking about data masking in production as well uh, and making sure that your least privileged users don't have access to privileged data, even in a, a payment gateway platform that would have credit card numbers. Uh, this applies to data uh, as it's displayed on screens, uh, paper receipts. You know, when you go to a restaurant, it doesn't print out your entire credit card number on the receipt. It just shows some of the digits so you can know what card was used. And uh, printouts, of course. You know, any system that has a print function uh, needs to potentially implement uh, data masking techniques as well to protect it. Uh, shown here is one of my favorite uh, MasterCards. Um, we had a co-branding experience uh, with Iron Man uh, to have the... Uh, what was it called? Uh, Marvel MasterCard. Um, and you could get different characters on them, of course, not just Iron Man. All right, so where are we on time? Uh, looks like we're about an hour and 20 in, and I'm uh, 
a little over halfway through the slides. So that's good. All right, so now it's time to talk about zero trust. Zero trust refers to an evolving set of network and security paradigms and principles that narrows defenses from wide network parameters uh, to individuals or small groups of resources. Uh, that's the, the essence of it. Um, I've got a link I'll pull up here in a second, but uh, Gartner published a marketing guide for zero trust uh, last in the last couple of years. And so you basically know that it's reaching mainstream awareness uh, and it's starting to actually head up uh, the hype cycle, right? We haven't reached the peak of, of hype around zero trust. Uh, and of course, the solar winds hack and, you know, the uh, uh, water treatment facility in Florida are perfect examples of, of why zero trust architectures, it's not really a tool, and I'll get into that in a minute. It's more of a philosophy uh, to architecture and design, and then you can use various tools to, to implement uh, zero trust architectures. Uh, let's see what else. Um, the term has its origins in the ability of moving security rules to the edge network, uh, to uh, CDNs, for example, uh, content uh, delivery networks. Think of like an Akamai caching node uh, that has a whole bunch of content in the past uh, so that that content downloads quickly for you. You know, the images um, on a Netflix um, or even potentially entire Netflix shows. Uh, but now you can actually move um, security logic and business logic into those edge nodes and not have to have all that implemented on the back end in your data center. Uh, this was, I believe, um, Akamai trying to eat away at uh, Cisco's uh, VLAN, right, lunch. Imagine like um, MPLS networks where you have multiple spread VLANs across data centers and offices all around the world, and you have this perimeter-based model. Uh, well, Zero Trust is, I think, you know, Akamai and Palo Alto and some other uh, uh, vendors' um, approach to kind of dismantle that piece of their budget and turn it into a budget for their products and tools. Um, so like I said, there's a hype cycle going on, but there's actually some really great security involved in Zero Trust and the ideas behind it. Uh, it's just not terribly easy for people to understand at first glance or to implement. Uh, but basically moving it to the edge, right? Moving your uh, role-based access controls to the edge network and giving people exactly, you know, what they need access to and nothing else. Uh, so it exposes, it allows you to expose all of your applications uh, on the internet and, and collapses the traditional inside-out design of perimeter-based network security but it requires micro segmentation of network services, right? So let's see, uh, being a developer, for example, and in zero trust could entail having access to just one dev environment and one Git repo, that's it. Uh, they do their code commits and then they access the web server to see how it performs. And they just you know, rinse and repeat and, and commit code, test, you know, reach their feature functionality. Um, prior to like a zero trust micro segmented network like that, the developer would open up a VPN connection, connect to the corporate network, and they would have access to everything, right? They could access the file shares for you know, the legal team, maybe not have permission to read them, but still the network access would be there by default in the design, in the architecture. Uh, they'd be able to access all the dev servers and all of the GitHub repositories and repos, not just the one that they needed. And so this idea of micro segmentation, getting down to like just singular permissions for particular users, uh, is at the heart of it. So least privilege, certainly one of the principles that Zero Trust uh, is, is helping to deliver. Uh, but the problem I found uh, is that uh, if you didn't have the discipline to do um, RBAC, right, role-based access controls, uh, when you did have a perimeter, how are you suddenly going to have the discipline to do that now just because you're pushing out a uh, Zero Trust architecture and you got people to buy into it? You still have to have granular permissions to find for what every user can do and can't do. And if you don't have that yet, then you can't actually populate the edge network with RBAC rules and granular you know, controls and micro segmentation. Uh, anyway, so that's one of, one of the challenges that I find is that uh, it doesn't solve the problem that kept people from doing a better job of security in the old paradigm, right? The perimeter based model uh, versus now, which is data centric uh, based. But you can think of it as a next step, zero trust, uh, as the next step in the evolution of trust, but verify. Uh, it basically turns into never trust, always verify. Um, persistent trusted remote access is the thing that zero trust is, is, is attacking and, and fixing for us, or at least asking us to fix. The challenges are, like I said, however, maintaining those access control rules and logic to permit such granular permissions. If granular permissions were easy, then they would have emerged and been deployed already. 
So the burden of maintaining hundreds of security groups and permissions needs to be weighed against the benefits and cost of such a system. Uh, displacing the MPLS VLAN lunch, like I said, and that budget piece on the, on the IT budget is however, uh, is, however, a reasonable tactic to take from the, the zero trust uh, vendors. Uh, like I said, Palo Alto uh, is doing a lot. I think it's John Kinderfach um, is one of the fathers of zero trust architectures uh, with a trademark you know, behind it. But zero trust has like a lowercase Z and a lowercase T um, equivalent where we just talk about it as a thing, right? A theme a principle uh, and moving off Z authorization you know, to the edge or caching networks. Uh, so here I want to throw up a quick uh, roundtable article. And I think security roundtable is a Palo Alto entity. Right, powered by Palo Alto Networks. Uh, but this is an article that was written uh, just this week, uh, yesterday it was published, uh, by one of my uh, colleagues, um, George Finney, who is a, I think, Southern Methodist, eh, Southern Methodist University um, professor, and um, he's an author and a security speaker. He's going to be doing um, a security uh, webinar next week, I think, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, that you can register for. I think it's probably listed here. Let me double check. Uh, no, I'd have to find it. Anyway, I'll put it into the Slack channel. Uh, but basically, he's talking about, you know, why we need zero trust ever more, you know, and what it could have been, you know, um, what zero trust had it been implemented in the Oldsmar um, uh, water treatment, or in this case, in the SolarWinds hack, if some of these companies like SolarWinds or some of the victims of the SolarWinds hack had uh, zero trust uh, um, architectures deployed. And here he talks about the three tenets of zero trust secure access, least privilege, and log everything. And this is just basic hygiene, right? You want to be doing things securely, right? Authenticated, verified, authorized. Uh, you want to have least privilege. That's been around as principle forever, but Zero Trust is bringing it to the fore. And then logging everything. You need to have logging enabled, otherwise you can't tell when things have gone wrong. And so this being one of the main tenets, uh, never trust, always verify. That's the idea. Uh, and then, of course, the sunburst malware, you know, waited two weeks before it executed phase two of its deployments and started beaconing out to command and control servers uh, to decide what to do next after having reached um, an infection uh, target uh, through the SolarWinds uh, Orion software updates. Uh, but anyway, so that was, you know, made it quite difficult, even for a zero trust architecture to be able to detect that low and slow uh, attack um, approach that uh, that the uh, Russian uh, APT-29 uh, is believed uh, to have implemented in the attack and in, in the hack. All right, uh, so next up, um, again, resizing my notes so that they fit on the screen. Great, uh, so we've done a little bit of zero trust. <clears throat> zero trust policy is based on who, what, when, where, and how. Uh, zero trust means granting least privilege access based on verifying who is requesting access the context of that request, so the when, uh, and the risk of the access environment. Um, and so, you know, part of the why. Uh, adaptive authentication is also an essential component into building a really good zero trust implementation. Just because the person has the right username and password and potential other factors, doesn't mean you should let them in. Uh, and so adaptive authentication looks at all sorts of interesting additional telemetry around the auth event uh, to decide whether to bump them up to two factor from one factor or from two factor to three factor. And uh, conversely, and this is to the benefit of us all, making our lives easier, but also still more secure, potentially bumping down from two factor to single factor or from single factor down to pass through off because you already have a valid Kerberos ticket, like I mentioned uh, last week, uh, because you already walked through the door and badged at the door and you're on the LAN and you authentic authenticated at your workstation in the office uh, for when we go back to working in offices again. These can be additional factors that uh, maintain security, but make it easier for users to do their job and to not have to be typing their password all day long, essentially. All right, so uh, remember that the who is increasingly not human uh, in, in zero trust. So we have to think about machines, right? And service APIs and machine to machine communication. Uh, and of course, you know, Lambda functions uh, being triggered based on, you know, activity. So zero trust is, is only possible at layer seven, uh, but you can also think uh, of as an omnipresent adaptive MFA. Zero trust means that you do not trust the system just because trusting the system is the vulnerability that's likely to be exploited. 
uh, like being on the land in a perimeter based and then saying, okay, you're on the land, you can do anything you want. Everything is open, you know, no authentication required, no authorization required. Uh, here, uh, as good a place as any to throw in a quick refresher on the OSI model, uh, Open Systems Interconnection. Uh, but you must have already seen or learned about OSI uh, before uh, my mentioning it here. Uh, there's a great story about how TCP IP um, actually usurped uh, OSI uh, with some interesting insights into the nature of standards creation and contrasting bottom up and top down approaches. Uh, continues uh, the discussion that was introduced in week one with Bruce Sterling's piece about the history of the internet. Uh, so here, let me pull up this link and uh, throw it into the notes. OSI, the internet that wasn't. If everything had gone according to plan, the internet as we know it would have never sprung up. That plan was devised many years ago. This article is, I think, from 2013. Um, but uh, instead would have created a comprehensive set of standards uh, called OSI. And so we still use and talk about the OSI model. Uh, and we've mapped it into TCP IP, but it was actually a competing uh, standard. And this is a great historical uh, article about how we got what we ended up getting and whether or not what we got was better. Um, it's still potentially debated um, as to whether or not, you know, the packet switch TCP IP network and the whole DARPA beginnings to it all, um, right? The first packet switch network, this is that article that you read on, on Bruce Stone. This, I wanted to introduce this article after that one because that one kind of gives you the lay of the land um, on the high level. And this one talks about one of the wars that was waged uh, with, you know, Vincert, uh, Vint and Cerf, you know, and uh, um, ICANN and the uh, Internet Consortium, you know, and naming uh, of networks and how we ended up with what we got. So anyway, there's a great article uh, that uh, talks about that uh, historical battle. All right, so let me pause here for a second and finish my ginger ale. All right, five o'clock, hour and a half in. So structured and unstructured, different types of data. On a fundamental level, there really actually only are two kinds of data. There's text and there's binary. Uh, yes, it's all ones and zeros under the hood, but data is going to be in one of these two fundamental formats. Another high level distinction is that uh, of operator and operand. So the operator is often a binary file and it's commonly an executable binary. Uh, an image is, is a binary file, but it's not executable. Uh, and uh, of course, an application or a program is an operator, right? That's the app like Microsoft Word or Google Chrome, right? These are the applications and programs that we run. Those are binaries. Um, the operand is the object of the operator. That's gonna be a file or another executable. Uh, so if you open up a local HTML file, HTML is text, the operator is going to be a web browser or a text editor, depending on what you choose. And of course, when you double click on some of these files in most operating systems, it has a mapping between the file type extension and what app you want to open it with. So if you click on a HTML file on your you know, desktop, it's going to open up your default web browser that's mapped to that. Or you can right click on it and then say what you want to open it with. And that where essentially you're getting a list of con context based operators. Uh, so operator operand splice the whole world into which is which and uh, text files and binary files. Uh, but there's more to it than that. So let's talk a little, little bit about uh, types of data and structured data. Structured data is far easier to digest and analyze than unstructured data. It contains clearly defined data types whose patterns are easy to parse and to search. Most structured data lives in databases. I think of relational databases being the most common. A high degree of maturity exists for the tools that process and analyze structured data. Fun fact, uh, the IBM 1928 punch card shown here is the reason that standard width for code is 80 characters. Uh, a further fun fact, constraints, uh, uh, so that's sort of why 80 is the common column width, um, because it's actually an inherited constraint uh, from punch cards, which had 80 columns. 
Uh, let's see, what was the fun further fact? Oh yeah, this one's a great one. Um, it's a, a bit of an aside, but it's an amusing one. I, I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, so constraints and limitations are often inherited, just like I mentioned with the 1928 punch card uh, forming a column width for terminal windows at 80 characters. And most code um, expecting you to have a line feed or a character turn you know, after uh, 80 characters as well. Uh, they, these basically are inherited and they echo down through uh, iterations of technology. Uh, take, for example, the size of the space shuttle booster rockets. Uh, they're actually constrained by the size of the tunnel uh, to get them from California to Florida, where the space shuttle was first launched. Uh, the tunnel was constrained by the gauge or width of the railway tracks. Uh, so basically, you know, railway tracks determine the size, the maximum size of um, the shuttle booster rockets. Uh, but those railroad gauges and the width of a train track was actually constrained by the UK gauge in the US that they're based on, uh, which were based on pre-road tramways in the UK, which were in turn based on wagon wheel spacing uh, which in turn was based on Roman war chariots, which traveled the first long distance road. So it's interesting because this means that the specifications for one of the most technologically advanced transportation systems in the, in the history of humanity was determined by the width of two Roman horses rear ends, AKA pulling the wagon, right? For the Roman war chariot. And then all the, uh, all of that uh, set of dependencies going backwards. Uh, so if you know the width of two Roman horses rear ends had been wider then the shuttle boosters could have been bigger. Um, but anyway, so there's a, a funny uh, article on this um, on astrodigital.org um, about uh, the STS, you know, the shuttle rockets uh, and, and horses. Uh, I think that link I can just copy here. I don't have to pull it up in front of you. But uh, it's in the lecture notes when you want to look at the slides later as well. Um, this, for me, if you've not seen it, there's a TV show that was on, I think, in the 70s and 80s uh, called Connections with James Burke. And it shows uh, very fascinating, you know, some of the dependencies uh, of technology and their inheritance and the constraints uh, that were created uh, that affect us to this day. Um, like the fact that uh, Napoleon uh, wanted his armies to eat well. And so he had somebody invent you know, vacuum packed canning of food uh, to preserve quality meats and soups and um, you know, stews and things uh, for his soldiers. And that's how they were able to take over part of the world so easily or much of the world uh, because they were well fed and uh, they had, you know, um, sterile canning, you know, procedures and techniques uh, invented for that purpose. Anyway, so the TV show is called um, Connections uh, by James Burke. Now uh, let's see, it looks like the sun's going down a bit further. Got to just adjust so that I'm not glaring at you too bright as it gets darker as the sun goes down. Okay, unstructured data. Unstructured data is essentially everything else. You have your structured data and then everything else. It's comprised of data that is usually not as easily searchable, um, including uh, formats like audio, uh, video, uh, social media postings. Uh, file shares are one very common form of, of unstructured data. Uh, some estimates put the ratio of structured to unstructured data uh, to be, say, 20 to 80 in most enterprises. Um, shown here is a visualization of a file share. Uh, it's color coded by file extension type, and the size of the boxes indicate the file size. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a tool called, I think, uh, dir size or tree dir size. I think that's what this one was. Um, but ben, basically that's like a whole hard drive in front of you. And you can tell based on file extension, you know, what the files are. And you can drill down, of course, and see the individual files that are on it, where they're stored. All right, uh, so semi-structured data. So all good dichotomies, um, which is a thing split into two parts, like I was talking about, structured, unstructured. Um, text and binary, and uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, I forget, uh, but anyway, you, you remember it. Um, all good dichotomies need exceptions to the rule. So yes, there are actually semi-structured data uh, also exists. Uh, common examples of semi-structured data are XML, JSON, and, and NoSQL. 
uh, XML. Uh, XML is a tag-driven structure. It's very highly flexible. Uh, coders can adapt it to universalize data structure, storage, and transport on the web. JSON consists of name value pairs or an object, uh, hash table, etc. And uh, in an ordered value list, uh, say or an array or a sequence or a list. Uh, this is a text uh, format. And then NoSQL. Uh, NoSQL databases differ from relational databases because they do not separate the organization of the data, aka the schema, from the actual data. Uh, this makes NoSQL a better choice to store information that does not easily fit into the record and table format, such as text uh, uh, with varying lengths. Uh, it also allows for easier data exchange between databases. So some newer NoSQL databases like MongoDB and Couchbase also incorporate semi-structured documents by natively storing them in the JSON format. And then lastly, I mentioned RDF, uh, Resource Description Framework. Uh, the specification for RDF actually came out around the same time as XML, which I think was around 1999. Uh, I'll go into the details of these in a couple of slides, uh, but it was actually harder for people to understand than XML. And so it didn't actually take off until the idea of the semantic web started to take hold. And I'm not even sure the idea of the semantic web has actually taken hold fully yet uh, um, uh, to, this, to this day. Uh, but let's dive into these uh, semi-structured data formats for a minute. Uh, extensible markup language, uh, XML. Uh, it's text-based, uh, it's encoded in UTF-8 and UTF-16 usually, and uh, World Wide Web Consortium XML Spec 1 uh, was from 1998. Uh, so I was working in San Francisco in uh, California in 1998 when the XML spec came out. Everyone was doing HTML, and then along came XML, and we're like, oh, okay, it's kind of like HTML, but you can extend it, and you can use, you know, these different namespaces. And that was one of the powerful things that... Uh, extensible markup language gave us. JSON was first standardized in 2013 uh, and brought forth in RFC uh, 7159. Uh, and if you want to see those RFCs, um, I highly recommend reading them, some of them, not all of them, uh, some of them every now and then just to be able to speak with firsthand knowledge. So I throw this into the chat. <clears throat> RFC uh, 7159 uh, in what? Uh, I think we said 2014, 2013. Um, and so this talks about uh, JSON. And so you can always go to ietf.org um, and you can look up uh, the RFCs and see uh, basically a request for comments, right? Uh, how, you know, someone's proposing, you know, to create uh, JavaScript object notification um, and uh, what else? It can represent four primitive types, strings, numbers, booleans, and null, two structured types, objects, and arrays and uh, conventions used and information. I'm not sure how many pages this is. Um, it's not that long, uh, 16 pages. And so just to understand that's how the internet grew up, right? Uh, RFCs would be created uh, and smart people would comment on them, uh, come together to find a standard and then everyone would work uh, together to implement applications to support the standard like HTML 1.0, HTML 2.0, you know, things like that. All right, so back to the next slide. Semi-structured data, NoSQL, moving on. Uh, data structures in NoSQL are usually key value, uh, wide column, graph, uh, and document. Such databases actually have existed since the late 1960s, but the name NoSQL was only coined by the needs of the so-called Web 2.0 companies. Web 2.0 itself was a term popularized maybe around 2004 or so by Tim O'Reilly and others. Uh, it refers basically to websites that emphasize user-generated content, ease of use, participatory culture, and interoperability, uh, compatible with other products, systems, and devices for end users. So if you can say that there was an epoch that occurred uh, around 2004 when this concept of Web 2.0 happened, pre-Web 2.0, aka Web 1.0, were a lot of brochure websites uh, that are just one way publish not lot not very interactive not a lot of user participated or generated content like forums and you know youtube is totally web 2.0 uh, 
right? Because they're publishing all that content. You know, it's not a one-way street from publisher to consumer. Everyone's a publisher. Everyone's a consumer. Uh, and of course, participatory culture and interoperability between different systems. You know, you have what um, you know, Google Maps interacting with uh, Uber. You know, to figure out your route and to plan. You know, how much it'll cost, how long it'll take. Uh, all of these things would be uh, Web 2.0 and higher type uh, technologies. All right, and now my favorite unloved uh, but awesome specification, RDF, uh, Resource Description Framework. So this came from the family of the W3C specifications. Originally, it was designed as a metadata data model, and it was adopted by the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, also in 1999, uh, just about a year after uh, XML. And it has to do with triples or tuples. So you have subject, predicate, and object. Uh, an example, the sky has the color blue. Sky is the subject, has the color, is the predicate or the verb, and blue is the object. So the goal of RDF was to build a vendor neutral and operating system independent of system data, uh, operating system independent system of metadata. You can think of HTML as having evolved into XML. Uh, and they're both fairly unstructured with regard to taxonomy and ontology. Taxonomy is a structure of you know, classes uh, and uh, classifications, ontology being the study of, of what something is. So finding a unique and unified namespace with which to build relationships between documents on websites and all over the internet, that was the dream. Hence you know, the idea of the semantic web uh, and Tim Berners-Lee, I think was definitely interested in it well ahead of his time. I guess, you know, we all stuck with HTML and XML for many years, uh, but I think we're getting closer now to understanding why, you know, RDF would be such a, a powerful way for us to have an extensible and unified namespace and unique for all pages, all um, addresses, all apps, all APIs, all services on the internet. Uh, and of course, the graph database uh, has taken up this concept of the triple, right, and the tuple or the triple store. Uh, graph databases uh, turn everything into triples with nodes, edges, and vertices. So both graph databases and RDF start out, you know, easy enough uh, with agreement on the basic predicates, um, the basic verbs, right? Is a member of, or, you know, is a child, you know, um, of, right? If you talk about parents and children, some of these relationships and verbs are very uncontestable, non-controversial. But it does start to get more subtle and nuanced when it becomes hard for everyone to get on the same page with uh, regard to all of the different verbs. Uh, so for example, I don't know, I think actually, yeah, that's right. The next slide, I go right into this um, graph database. So it uses graph structures for semantic queries with nodes, edges, and properties to represent and store data. I'm going to uh, mention this example. So. Um, I had an idea to create a, uh, a Marvel Alexa skill. Uh, it was an idea that I did some work on uh, with some machine learning folks at, at Google as a uh, pet project for a while. The idea was to teach an AI to read comics uh, and to create and assemble the metadata about each panel and all of the text bubbles um, because that information is not actually in a database yet, uh, structured or semi-structured. And so, and then publish a JSON API for the Alexa skill so that you could traverse 81 years of comics uh, with a voice assistant. And then of course, maybe throw in a VR headset and your favorite Marvel character would walk up to you uh, and give you a tour of the Marvel comic universe or other universes. Uh, so for example, you start and you say, okay, Alexa, what is vibranium? Vibranium then says, oh, well, it's a metal that's mined in Wakanda. And so you say, okay, what is Wakanda? And next, uh, Alex comes back and says, okay, well, Wakanda is a fictional place in, in you know, the Marvel comic universe uh, where Black Panther comes from. And you say, okay, um, you know, tell me what is Black Panther? Who's Black Panther? And so Alexa will come back again, talking to the JSON API, understanding the taxonomy and ontology of all of this stuff that's been trained and learned, you know, by reading 81 years of comics. Uh, it could say, you know, T'Challa is, you know, the Black Panther and his, you know, father, T'Chaka was, you know, also the Black Panther. And maybe now that, uh, you know, Chadwick Boseman's uh, passed away, it could become Siri or, or Suri, right? She could uh, become the next 
uh, Black Panther. So you have this idea of mantle as well, uh, which is important because in a complicated Marvel Comics API, you need to explain all sorts of complexities, like parallel universes, alternate timelines where Spider-Man is Chip Miles Morales and not Tobey Maguire from the films, uh, or even Spider-Gwen, right, in an alternate universe where you know, Spider-Man is a woman. Um, but uh, anyway, so it was really fun. Uh, to use this uh, Marvel Comics API for a couple of hackathons that we ran when I was there with MIT and Stanford students uh, exploring mashups uh, with the Marvel Comics API. And uh, some of these graph databases, um, uh, OriantDB and uh, Neo4j, for example. And so here I want to pull out uh, an example of one that someone made. Uh, and for those of you that are Marvel Comics fans that can't wait to look at the lecture notes to get this link, um, this is the link I'm looking at right now. Uh, so the Marvel Universe Social Network, right? Social Graph, Graph Database, uh, an artificial social network of heroes. And so you can actually download um, these CSVs and you can play around you know, with this project that someone put together on, on Kaggle. Um, and you can load them up into RDF tools and explore them. And there's people that have created visualizations of this, you know, that are quite fasc fascinating. Um, and this was just one example of one of them that I uh, found. Uh, but there's several others out there um, that are interesting um, that have, you know, sort of allow you to explore uh, the uh, complexities of uh, social graph databases and what I, you know, described earlier, uh, RDF, triple stores, uh, resource description framework. Uh, so that's the aside for this one. And of course, here you have Avengers Assemble as this thing, right? Uh, and of course, you know, uh, at some point, uh, what, uh, um, Captain America was not a member of the Avengers, right? So that triple store, Captain America is a member of the Avengers, uh, was not true, right? During uh, uh, Civil War, Avengers Civil War, uh, you know, he was um, kind of out of them for a while. And so it has this aspect of temporality as well that's involved. Um, and uh, all sorts of uh, cool things can be done with RDF. That's what I'm basically saying. All right, so data and the future of privacy engineering. So I think of um, privacy engineering as a new discipline that's going to be taking up and becoming job descriptions everywhere. And I think of it as the intersection of application security, AppSec, uh, and your typical InfoSec you know, talent plus a database administrator, um, because most data lives in some kind of database, and someone from the legal team uh, and talking about privacy and implementing principles of privacy uh, and principles of fairness uh, into uh, algorithms and into uh, our products and our infrastructure. Uh, and so I wanted to introduce this idea uh, when we talk about privacy engineering, uh, differential privacy. Uh, I learned about it um, at a lecture uh, given by the author of this book, uh, The Ethical Algorithm. Uh, what's his name? Um, not Aaron Roth. It was Michael Kearns, who's a professor of computer science at the University of Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly. Uh, differential privacy is a system for publicly sharing information about a data set by describing the patterns of groups uh, within the data set while withholding information about the individuals in the data set. Uh, so that's differential privacy. How much differential privacy is there? It's a measure right, in a data set. Another way to describe differential privacy is a constraint on the algorithms used to publish aggregate information about a statistical database, which limits the disclosure of private information of records who, uh, uh, whose information is in the database. So allegedly anonymized data sets routinely leak our most sensitive personal information. Uh, statistical mod models for everything from mortgages to college admissions, they reflect racial and gender bias and algorithmically now as well. Meanwhile, users manipulate algorithms to sort of game search engines uh, and uh, to get search engine ranking, uh, to get past spam filters uh, for online reviewing services and uh, navigation apps. There's all sorts of gaming going on, right, to get uh, uh, people people and data and information uh, that wasn't supposed to be shared. Uh, but it's possible to embrace privacy in the actual algorithms. Uh, but concepts like fairness and other ethical terms, they're a bit harder to approach. But privacy, we can do. Uh, and so I highly recommend reading this book, um, The Ethical Algorithm. Uh, but uh, we at least better try to do it in the code uh, rather than just wait for regulators you know, and oversight committees to seek ways you know, to apply fairness and privacy sort of after the fact. And so <clears throat> I have a link for the book, uh, Goodreads. 
so that you can add it to your wish list uh, for reading at another point in time. Uh, great book. Um, really cool talking with the author. Uh, he spoke in New York um, back when people met in person, which wasn't that long ago, if I remember correctly, right? It's only about a year ago that we all went on lockdown. Um, all right. So next up, um, AI Now. So this uh, AI Now grew out of a 2016 symposium led by Meredith Whit Whitaker, uh, the founder of Google's Open Research Group, and Kate Crawford, uh, principal researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, focus uh, of this uh, is inequality, labor, ethics, and healthcare. Uh, so here I'll do a quick plug uh, for the AI Now Institute, uh, which you can find here, uh, the Wikipedia page, and of course you can go to the web page itself for the AI Now Institute. Uh, so this is a bit of a plug for some of these NYU institutions and organizations. And the other piece that I was going to mention here is uh, yeah, the AI Now Institute itself, their web page. And because uh, if we don't sort of co opt AI, it's going to co opt us, right? And so we need to make sure that we're keeping, you know, the algorithms ethical and the people uh, that regulate and control you know, technology are aware of some of the public interests uh, that should try to be maintained. Uh, in this effort. And so here I'll pause to describe the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology, so PIT, PIT. Uh, there's several universities, uh, among them Harvard, Stanford, MIT, you know, lots of um, Ivy League schools, uh, have a PIT. And so the NYU Alliance is a way to bring together, because what's the opposite of public interest technology? Private interest technology. And that's kind of what a lot of big technology companies are, right? Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, all sorts of companies that are making money, you know, and we are the product. And so it's actually um, Tim Berners-Lee is starting a group as well, which I should mention, uh, interrupt. I think I might have mentioned it before, but this is the idea of his group um, changing everything and bringing it back, you know, ownership of our data about us to us. And so I think I even have an article open here. <clears throat> about it as well. Yeah, his plan to save the internet and give us back control of our data. So he's still working on it. He feels like he did something that got perverted and turned into an awful thing, which some by some measures, you know, is true. That, that actually did happen. Uh, things got a little out of hand. The internet didn't turn into this amazing, lovely thing that uh, everyone had hoped it would be. Um, and I can maybe make myself a little less blue as the light on the evening goes on. All right. And that was AI Now and the NYU Alliance. Oh, yeah, I didn't talk enough yet really quickly about the Alliance. So I've joined the NYU Alliance um, and I'm an associate. Um, and there's basically, you know, discussions and projects that are being done, you know, for uh, all sorts of excellent research uh, that the Alliance is helping support. Uh, they're going to be doing a, a career fair um, day coming up soon uh, where you will be able to look for jobs in technology and security uh, that are public interest uh, jobs. And uh, there's a whole university network called PIT UN uh, that links them all together. And uh, there was a kickoff with some great, um, I think it was here, videos. Um, from the uh, opening remarks that were done uh, February of last year. So just a year and a week ago. And um, they kicked off and there's some great, uh, I would recommend checking all of them out. Uh, technology and disability, um, making data great again. That was a MAGA reference that Julia Lane had um, from NYU Wagner on urban science and policy. These lectures are phenomenal. Um, I was there in person you know, for the whole day. I took the day off work so I could go uh, to this uh, um, AI datification and human rights, um, tech and policing. Um, what else? Was that the one that talked about? Uh, no, there's one of them that, that talked about uh, um, use of AI uh, in uh, the Netherlands and how they had recently uh, gained a win uh, against you know, the inappropriate use of um, you know, racial profiling through algorithms. In absentia, data in presence and absence. Um, this one was, um, like I said, all of them are amazing. 
Um, Julia Stojanovic uh, was talking about the NYU Center for Data Science uh, and Responsible Robotics, um, what technologists need to know about bias, um, and uh, Ilka Schellemann, uh, so I think was the Dutch one. But anyway, so uh, a great um, place to go and, and catch some uh, supplementary information uh, about uh, the uh, NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology and uh, the folks that put it together and the steering committee and uh, the founders and associates. Um, I think you can see me in here somewhere. Where's my photo? It's probably alphabetical. Yep, there I am at the end. Uh, but anyway, lots of folks are involved in it and it's a really good a really good effort uh, and it kind of had been going on but it had never actually been given a name and started meeting as a group and so that's what's happened now in the last year all right so let's talk a little bit about privacy by design you can't talk about privacy engineering without talking about gdpr because it was one of the most impactful um and uh significant uh bits of legislation that has come down in a while so privacy by design calls for privacy to be taken into account throughout the entire engineering process uh, not just uh, in the implementation of controls on a live system that's been, you know, that's being used. Uh, the European GDPR regulation incorporates privacy by design, of course, and some of the principles involved are proactive and not reactive. Um, so you need to make sure there's privacy in the system proactively and not just waiting and someone calls out and says, hey, there's too much private data in that system. Let's fix it. Uh, so you're being called upon to be proactive instead of reactive with your designs, uh, to be preventative and not remedial. Uh, another principle, uh, privacy by default, uh, seems common sense, but hasn't always been the default. Um, privacy embedded into the design and not just bolted on later. Uh, full functionality, uh, positive sum, uh, not zero sum. So what we want is a win-win situation, right? So we want a functional system, but we want a private system one that enforces uh, or in endorses uh, the ability to have privacy. And of course, <clears throat> we want end-to-end -end secrecy. That's obviously a, a great principle to throw in there, difficult to achieve sometimes because of you know, sharing of data between systems. Um, but you want full lifecycle protection as well of the data uh, from QA data uh, to um, production data. Well, let's see, uh, visibility and transparency, keep it open. Uh, that's how it can be better regulated and privacy can be enhanced. Uh, there should be a respect, a principle of respect for user privacy and to keep it user centric. Don't let the corporations have all the control, right? The Tim Berners-Lee interrupt, um, you know, inversion of the productization of people's privacy. And of course, these principles did not come without some criticisms of the idea. Take, for example, the definition of personal data uh, in GDPR. Uh, not PII, but just personal data. Uh, it requires subject consent. All those new cookie banners, you know, that were showing up on websites saying, hey, you know, we do, we're collecting data. We, this is our GDPR banner. You know, this is how we're going to do it. And you click OK uh, or you click no. Um, but if you you actually can't have um, a TCP three way handshake uh, in exchange on the web, right, between, you know, a client, my laptop and a server uh, without exchanging an IP address. Right. That's just how a connection gets created right over port 80 or port 443 for um, HTTPS. Uh, so suddenly, you know, and in many cases, IP addresses are, are actually classified as personal data. And it's completely impossible for them to not actually collect that data and log it without your consent. Because uh, you can't even display a consent form until the three-way handshake has been <laughs> performed. And you've established, you know, a SYN, SYNAC, and ACK um, packet between you and the other side. Uh, so they know that, you know, there are architecturally challenges to this idea, that there won't be some personal data recorded prior to consent um, but basically you know what if somebody clicks oh you know don't you know please forget me it's supposed to then go back in and delete all of those logs um, of those first requests that led up to clicking on the button that said forget me i don't think people are actually architecting that anywhere um, but there are loopholes in the gdpr and ccpa which is that you get to keep certain kinds of data if it's useful in anti-money laundering and anti-fraud and security investigations which is kind of a large loophole because you could say, well, all data is interesting potentially in an anti-money laundering and anti-fraud investigation. So anyway, privacy by design um, is a concept you know, that requires some uh, unpacking. And um, this is uh, the Wikipedia page on that. So throw that into the chat again as well. 
And of course, um, in case you're not aware, when these recordings get posted, I put up the full lecture notes for you in case you want to read them and follow the links in my notes. Uh, but also the transcripts of the recording are uploaded as well. Um, and uh, so you can get those transcripts. Uh, and that's why I'm pasting some of the links in there. But all, all, all of these links that I'm pasting in, they're actually coming straight out of the deck. So you don't have to pull down the transcript and the deck in order to get the links. All right, so just a couple more slides left, and then we'll jump into uh, InfoSec and the news for this week. Um, so the first um, CCPA case, right, the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, went into effect uh, Salesforce and Hannah Anderson. Uh, and of course, the first case is a precedent setting, right? It sets and establishes the precedent uh, for the legislation and for proper um, application of it to uh, actual cases. So this case serves as an important reminder for businesses to evaluate their security environments against what are called the top 20 cr critical controls, uh, the CIS, Center for Internet Security Controls, uh, cisecurity.org, uh, which the California Attorney General, it's interesting, um, back at the time when this uh, legislation was um, discussed, Kamala Harris was the uh, California Attorney, Attorney General. So she actually had a big influence on um, adopting what are called best practices for security, uh, which are now being applied in the CCPA cases. And I'm not sure where the status of this case was. Um, I know over the summer, some of the students had some updates on it, but uh, anyway, uh, it, it recognizes the, the California Attorney General's office when it prosecuted you know, and set up some of these um, best, uh, uh, best practices uh, references. They recognize um, as rep the CIS top 20 controls as a minimum level of information security that all organizations that maintain or uh, collect personal information have to meet. So if you're not doing CIS top 20, uh, you're going to get in big trouble. Uh, you're going to have to do CIS top 20 controls. Um, and you can actually buy um, a subscription uh, to get um, AMI images that are pre-hardened to level one or level two for Linux and Windows. So you don't have to harden them. You actually buy a pre-hardened AMI through CIS uh, and it saves you tons of effort you know, in hardening your own bare metal uh, or VM you know, servers. And so I, I recommend that to folks that don't want to have to get good at, at hardening servers. You can just buy, you know, like I said, pre-hardened images. Uh, and that can get you DOD certification as well if you're doing uh, government work uh, for your infrastructure. Uh, but anyway, so many issues with the CCA, including ambiguity about retaining data and security for forensics uh, purposes, like I mentioned uh, in investigations, uh, as well as the business um, has um, what's called a right to cure um, before a prosecution can be uh, um, uh, initiated. And there's no real clarity around, you know, what that might evolve with regard to some of these data breaches. I'm just sure that CCPA and NYPA is going to drive up cyber insurance premiums uh, in the coming years. And, uh, you know, that's a bad thing, but, uh, you know, insurance uh, is a hedging, right, and a counterbalance game. Uh, one of the other things I want to mention before closing is uh, Google's privacy hub. Uh, so Sundar, um, the Google CEO, posted this on their blog in what, May, I think, of 2019. And... Um, they had uh, an opening for Google Safety Engineering Center, uh, GSEC, in Munich, Germany. And a growing number of privacy engineers there uh, to more than 200. Job descriptions for those jobs uh, mentioned cookie management and encryption. Uh, and so these are some of the technologies, obviously, that are involved in privacy engineering. And that's the last topic that we're discussing. Um, Azure, Microsoft, and Facebook, they're all making similar moves in an effort to avoid the uncertain impact of potential regulatory conditions being created uh, that would potentially regulate them. And so they're working on, you know, trying to come up with ways to self-regulate before a heavy hand of the government comes down on them. And this one's Microsoft's data protection resources, in case you're not familiar with it, because uh, they have lots of stuff uh, for you to read and understand about how they implement uh, their government cloud and their DOJ certified you know, infrastructures. Uh, different control mappings for GDPR, Azure, Office 365, um, ISO 27001 certifications, things like that. All right, so that has taken us <clears throat> to <clears throat> the InfoSec in the News section. I think I've got about 20 minutes. Um, so let's jump over to a full screen share. 
and jump out of the web and jump into Slack. All right, so here's the InfoSec News channel. Uh, like I told you before, it's got lots of interesting stuff uh, feeding into it. And I will look through some of these stories with the hat of, uh, you know, how it might affect you uh, as an InfoSec person working in a company now or in the future uh, as related to this week's topic, which is data classification. Uh, so <clears throat> how to bypass uh, antivirus and uh, endpoint detection and response with safe mode. So guess what might not be running in safe mode? Yes, antivirus and EDR. Also, attackers do not need to be physically in front of the machine to run in safe mode. Um, not really data classification, but a good story. Personalize your Windows 10 desktop. Eh, nope. Computer malware fraudster gets two years in prison. The man who played a key role in computer malware scam has been sentenced to two years in prison. Uh, not really a data classification story. Uh, leading Canadian rental company hit by dark side ransomware. Uh, well, I'm curious what the data classification is of uh, the data that was hit uh, in this uh, ransomware attack. So let's take a look. Uh, leading Canadian rental car. Uh, Canadian discount car and truck rentals was hit with a dark side ransomware attack with the hackers claimed to have stolen 120 gigs of data. Uh, discount car and truck rentals is a leading Canadian car and truck rental company with 300 locations throughout Canada. Uh, so obviously the data subjects, you know, um, rights that are involved in this story and uh, uh, are subject to Canadian jurisdiction. Um, but they could have data on plenty of non-Canadians. Um, and if they have at least 50,000 records of Californians, this ransomware breach has to be disclosed to California and could be subject to a G uh, CCPA um, uh, litigation as well. Uh, let's see, the dark side ransomware gang has disrupted the online rental services at discountcar.com. Discount car and truck rentals was subject to a ransomware attack that impacted the discount headquarters office. A fully dedicated team isolated and contained the attack quickly. Uh, the team is working to investigate and restore the services quickly and safely as possible. So I wonder if discountcar.com is online right now. I suppose it should be, right? Because the website shouldn't have been taken down. Oh, no. They actually did have their website whacked um, because of this hack. Uh, interesting. Uh, well, that makes me want to jump over here and do a curl against it and just see what they're running. Car All right, let's see. So Apache, so they've hardened it. It's no longer showing the server header showing the exact version. That's good. Uh, it's got a 302, of course, and it went to this partners rental car.com discount car rental. So they probably can't even host their own website right now. So they have some kind of like DNS redirect going on, sending them off to rental car.com, which is not them. Uh, even hosting a sorry page for them, right? Um, so let's see, uh, rentalcar.com. Rentalcar.com, domain name was created in 1995. DNS records updated, uh, who is registry was updated in 2019. And looks like they're using a uh, obfuscation of, of details, right? We're not getting any details about them. Uh, but yeah, or admin organization is Enterprise rent -a car So I'm not sure if Enterprise rent -a car has a relationship with them or if they're just being nice and hosting a sorry page for them. Because uh, if you look at this um, uh, web logo, right? That's like totally like grabbed from like some way back, you know, machine archive.org, probably graphic for the site. Uh, for discount truck uh, car rentals it's not a really nice logo uh, but in the end you have to at least you know get something up right uh, if you've been hacked and uh, it's hosted somewhere else one of the things you could probably do is just do like a status url like status dot um, discount car.com i don't think they have one no no they don't um, and if we wanted to just do spelunk their dns briefly we could do um, python sublister uh, Three. Now load 
out is this. So sublister, I think I told you about this one before, right? It uses all these different sources to find information about domain names that existed for them. And again, how things are named is uh, very telling, right? It tells you a lot about a company. And I like I told you before, Discount Car uh, is, um, uh, no, not Discount Car. Uh, sublister is one of my favorite tools. So it looks like airwatch.discountcar.com exists, right? So that means they have a mobile device, mobile an MDM solution from uh, VMware, uh, Airwatch. I wonder if that's actually up right now, or at least they had one in the past. It may not exist. If I do a uh, uh, if I do a NS lookup or a dig of um, Airwatch, um, yeah, it looks like there is an A record. But anyway, so that's one of the tools that they're using. I doubt they got in through the that. Um, what else? Um, Barracuda, not sure what that is. It could just be part of their naming convention. Uh, they have an analytics uh, site, body shop, broadcast, careers, corporate site. I'm guessing the corporate site was probably the one hit. Uh, it just always seems to be the weakest link, right? Those kinds of things. Uh, then they have a whole bunch of random host names that are used for stuff um, and a gateway, GW. Uh, what else do we see? Insurance, uh, kiosk. Uh, mail for their mail servers. Uh, they probably have mail one, mail two, you know, for people that reach mobile test instance, um, network dot, interesting name, OTA, um, over the air. Uh, that's probably for provisioning of mobile uh, stuff. Um, and what else? Uh, web test, other users, URLs. I doubt web test is uh, up right now. Because again, this thing came back. Yeah, no, this IP address that came back here. Uh, is probably my default lookup for domain names on Verizon that don't resolve. Um, but anyway, so that's one uh, quick dive into a story from Discount Car. And what else did they say? Data classification, uh, ransomware leak, came to have stolen unencrypted data, including finance, marketing, banking account, account, and franchisee, franchisee data. So there's a lot of litigation that's going to come out of this, right? As proof of the data theft, DarkSide posted numerous pictures of the rentals folder listings. So you have cash forecasts, um, fiscal year 2010, I imagine that is. Um, bud, stub year, whatever that is, bud, probably budget. Um, while the stolen data's legitimacy is not confirmed, DarkSide is known to exfiltrate unencrypted files before they deploy the ransomware to encrypt the devices. DarkSide has had its share of drama. Since launching the operation in August, they've had a bit of drama as a ransomware group. They decided to donate 20,000 of extortion money to the Children International and Water Project charities. Interesting. Uh, you know, it's like bad guys have a Yelp, you know, um, rating and uh, um, uh, reputation that they need to protect uh, and enhance, right? They have like corporate social responsibility for ransomware uh, in order to contribute to, uh, um, they had no intention of keeping the donation because it's illegally obtained, you know, so the plans backfired, but anyway, um, what else? Uh, some of them, you know, anyway, that uh, is unfortunately all too common of a tale of what happens um, when you're uh, lax with your security uh, uh, or someone clicks on something, right? Ransomware is usually uh, phishing or spear phishing, kind of um, patient zero before it spreads. What are your mitigations to stop that? Obviously, having backups uh, is your way of avoiding to have to pay the ransom. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, make sure that any data that lives on a laptop is completely disposable, um, meaning it never needs to be restored. You just simply send out a you know new laptop uh, that's been reformatted, have them ship back the old laptop in the box that you sent to them, wipe the data, maybe pull a couple of the hard drives uh, for forensic analysis of infected users uh, so that you can do a criminal prosecution down the line uh, if a case is needed. You'll need to maintain a chain of custody on that hard drive. So you have to fill out a chain of custody form, send it off to a third party like Dell SecureWorks or something to do a forensic analysis and figure out what they were browsing or what they clicked on You know that delivered the malware how the malware got past the uh, antivirus solutions or endpoint detection that was on there. Of course, if you didn't have any on there, uh, you're going to look pretty bad in the uh, root cause analysis and report that gets generated. But at least you can use that report to get a budget 
to buy endpoint protection to avoid this kind of thing happening in the future. Let's say, presuming you're working at uh, discountcar.com and you wanted to leverage this crisis uh, to fix things in the future. Because the, the worst thing in the world isn't getting hacked. The worst thing in the world is dealing with it badly and not owning the narrative, not putting out a press release, not figuring out how to move forward and rehabilitate and you know get the bad guys off of your infrastructure which apparently took over the website. Uh, so that means there was not good zero trust architecture in place there as well. Um, so I'm guessing they had a perimeter based security model and not a data centric security model uh, to protect uh, their business. All right, what else? Chinese supply chain attack on computer systems. Bloomberg has a major story about a Chinese hacking computer motherboards made by Supermicro, Lenovo and others. It's gonna be, that's been going on at least since 2008. The government has known about it for almost as long as trying to keep the attack secret. Hmm. Motherboards, supply chain attack. Um, not really today's topic, but a good story to be looked at. That one's on one of Bruce Steyer's links, so I'll open it briefly just to take a look at the story. Chinese supply chain attack, uh, blah, blah, blah. A FISA Act, um, according to officials, um, they've known about this since at least 2012. There's lots of detail in the article. I recommend you read it. Uh, this is a follow on with a lot more detail to a story Bloomberg reported on in 2018. I didn't believe the story back then. I don't think it's real. Yes, it's plausible. But first of all, if someone actually surreptitiously put malicious chips into motherboards on moss, we would have seen a photo of the alleged chip already. And second, there are easier, more effective and less obvious ways of adding backdoors to networking equipment. I seem to have been wrong. Mike Quinn, a cybersecurity executive who served as a senior role at Cisco and Microsoft, said he was briefed about added chips on super micro motherboards from officials in the U.S. Air Force. Quinn was working for a company that has a potential bidder, blah, blah, blah. Um, this could be a disinformation campaign as well. Who knows? Um, there's so, I mean, I trust and believe many things that Bruce Schneier says, but um, uh, it's hard to know whether he was wrong then and is being made right now or if he's being you know, fooled by you know, um, disinformation and says that you know, there really aren't um, you know, uh, additional chips added to motherboards you know, that are used for backdoor. I mean, it's certainly plausible um, as a supply chain attack. Um, but anyway, I would recommend, recommend looking at this even though it wasn't exactly uh, this week's uh, topic. Um, looks like a strong story to stay abreast of. Uh, let's see, hunting for CVE 2021 with audit D Audit D is an audit daemon on Linux. Um, uh, the project is a 10 year old sudo vulnerability. Um, this one's been going around for a while. Sudo is a technique for becoming a root super user without knowing the root password. So you can give sudoers permission, uh, which are kind of like sudo PSEUDO permissions uh, to do root level things without knowing the root credential. Um, there's a vulnerability that affects Macs as well and Linux. And uh, I think you should have patched for it by now if you haven't, uh, but anyway, that was, I think, a story from a few weeks ago that's getting some more attention. Uh, vast majority of phishing and malware campaigns are small scale and short lived. Almost 1.2 billion email phishing and malware attacks um, showed that most campaigns are short lived and sent to fewer than 1,000 targets over a period of one to three days. Interesting. Uh, vast majority, oh, wait, that was the same, sorry, uh, blogs. What you know, need to know about the CIS CSAT version 1.4 updates. We were just talking about CIS, right? Center for Internet Security and their controls and the fact that you can buy uh, hardened images for AWS so you don't have to harden them yourselves. And that the CIS top 20 is considered minimum table stakes, right? For operating uh, infrastructure in a responsible fashion. Uh, let's see, Yandex employee caught selling access to users' email inboxes, uh, Russian Dutch domiciled search engine ride hailing an email service provider Yandex on Friday disclosed a data breach that compromised 4,887 email accounts of its users. All right, so that's um, a data classification story. So let's open that link up for a minute. <clears throat> Yandex employee. So this is insider threat. And if you don't have an insider threat program and you can't monitor and detect anomalous uh, suspicious behaviors, uh, your InfoSec program is lacking something that it needs. Everyone should have an insider threat program. Uh, it shouldn't be complete surveillance of everyone all the time, but you should have the ability to look at what people are doing and catch someone like this insider. 
uh, or at least have you know, evidence that you can use to, to prosecute them later once it comes to light. Uh, the company blamed the incident on an unnamed employee who had been providing unauthorized access to the user's mailboxes for personal gain. The employee was one of three system administrators with the necessary access rights to provide technical support. Um, yeah, we talked about least privilege, who's watching the watchers. There'll be a lecture on that later on uh, as to how you can surveil, not surveil, how you can provide some degree of oversight into what your highly privileged users, you know, these three systems administrators, because one of them decided to you know, do stuff uh, <laughs> to make uh, personal money, profit and gain. Uh, it was also said there was no evidence that user payment details were compromised during the incident. Uh, and it had not notified affected mailbox owners to change, although it had notified notified affected mailbox owners to change their passwords. Uh, so basically, a support person was selling access to the email, but not selling you know PCI data. Uh, it's not immediately clear whether the breach, when the breach occurred, or when the employee began offering unauthorized access. Uh, a thorough investigation of the incident is underway, and X will be making changes to administrative access procedures. Uh, what would those some of those changes be? Uh, you would basically lock the systems administrators with that privilege out of persistent uh, access to that credential. Uh, you would put it in a password vault, for example, and you would only let them access the password vault to break glass and to do these administrative functions where they can uh, look inside of people's emails when there's a trouble ticket open for it, right? Or, or there's an audit trail. Of, of when they do that. And there's an alert that goes off saying, hey, one of the sysadmins just broke glass and is going and looking at people's emails. Uh, and then rotate the credential after um, the access to the vault and the incident's legitimate reason for them to go and, and investigate and do the support function. Because you can't stop systems administrators from doing their jobs, but you can make it more transparent, uh, you know, a more robust process. And so that would be one of the things I would do in this case if I were to go and to uh, try to tell them how they can make things better after this happened, right? To minimize the potential for compromise uh, and abuse. Uh, the company has also contacted law enforcement. So here's what we're talking about, right? You need chain of custody on that user's laptop, all of the log files um, and access records of who they accessed and when. And you're gonna have to go back an indefinite period of time to figure out the scope of impact to see who you need to notify. So I'm guessing you're going to need over a year of data, if not more, uh, if the person's been doing it for a while. And you can then claim or know if they were not in your employ for a year, then you can just do the period in which they were employed there. Um, but many of these systems administrators could have been with Yandex, you know, for multiple years. And we could go social engineering, look up, you know, who's a Yandex sysadmin, you know, in LinkedIn and probably find out who it is. And I'm sure people will go and do that, but I won't do that right now. Uh, see, insider threats continue to hit companies, and so now they expand it you know, to a couple of stories about a 35-year-old Dallas-based ADT technician who pleaded guilty to computer fraud and invasive visual recording for repeatedly breaking into cameras that he installed and viewed, uh, engaging in uh, personal activities in the home. Uh, in December, former Cisco engineer uh, Sudish Kasaba Ramesh, 31, was sentenced to 24 months in prison for deleting uh, 16,000 WebEx accounts without authorization, costing the company more than 2.4 million uh, with uh, 1.4, no, that's not, oh, employee time and customer refunds. That's where they calculated the cost impact. Yeah, so that would certainly fund, um, you know, 2.4 million worth of uh, um, InfoSec uh, tooling if you had that uh, event and then you wanted to justify, you know, the budget request for it later. Anyway, so a great story uh, about, um, you know, abuse of privileged and privileged users and access and data classifications and designing for privacy, right? And designing, like we mentioned, uh, uh, according to GDPR, uh, to avoid that happening. Since Yandex is Russian owned and what, US and Russian owned, I don't know if GDPR comes in, you know, to scope right away. But certainly if some of the violated individuals records uh, were Europeans, which I'm sure they were, uh, that would be included. Uh, what else is in here before we finish up the last minute of today? Uh, some of the FBI feeds have popped some stories on justice.org. Um, what else? Public assistance and the location of people. No, not necessarily today's topic. Um, uh, what else? 
the weekend ransomware, no, do squids fly, no, abuse in the cloud, um, cloudsecurityalliance.org, uh, shorthand for encompassing abuse, misuse, malice, and crime, no, not really. Scallops, vaccines, and Tesla, the wild world of blockchain and crypto. Yeah, I think um, they bought some, Elon Musk bought some uh, cryptocurrency recently and popped the value uh, of all cryptocurrencies. Um, M Health apps expose millions to cyber attacks. Well, this is definitely data classification and, and confidential, confidential sensitive data. All right, so let's spend the last minute looking at this. Um, M Health apps expose millions. Oh, mobile health apps. Oh, okay, so this is not a particular um, breach incident. This is more just a security researcher, researcher testing 30 of these apps and they found that all of them had vulnerable APIs. Uh, with some 23 million mHealth app users exposed to application programming interface attacks. Yeah, the hackers don't need to go to the websites. You know, they can go straight for uh, the API. It turns out uh, they're all available or vulnerable to one degree or another. The average number of downloads for each app tested was over 700,000. According to the resulting report from AppRoof, out of 30, 77% of them contained hard-coded API keys which would allow an attacker to intercept the exchange of information. Oof, that's horrible. Another 7%, anyway, I would never run a mobile app <laughs> if I didn't have to. Uh, I would rather just make an HTML5 compatible website uh, that works on mobile, because why maintain all of that extra code base and library? Even for complicated functions, you know, you can almost not tell the difference between a native mobile app and HTML5 based apps uh, these days. So I think there's very little reason for people to make actual mobile apps. Instead, just make it mob your website mobile friendly and use all that budget that you might put into an Android and an iOS app uh, to making your site mobile friendly. And then you only have one attack surface, one set of code to protect <clears throat> and put it all into protecting your APIs, obviously, according to this article. All right, so I think that's it. I'm gonna hit stop share. And uh, this has been week number three, um, uh, the subdomain DNS tool. Um, it was called um, Sublister. And let me pull up that link for you. Uh, get, I think it's actually listed on the uh, class uh, website. Um, let me give you that, uh, the Google site because um, then you can find the link from there. So this is uh, the site you should be able to reach. And if you go to the useful links page, um, you will see Sublister uh, provided there. And Sublister for the impatient uh, can be found here. Uh, so anyway, yeah, really good reconnaissance tool, command line, just to figure out, you know, what DNS entries exist and used to exist because it does DNS dumpster. Not all of them are live, but it's still, it tells you a lot about a company in one single command. All right, uh, so that's this week's lecture. Thanks for joining. It looks like we had a fair number of participants listening and I'll see you in the Slack channels. It's going to be um, two teams instead of three and hopefully everyone's been admitted into one of the two teams. Uh, you guys owe me a uh, team name uh, list of members, including the person emailing me, uh, and the lightweight um, target uh, um, in your proposals, your draft proposals uh, for this weekend. And um, yeah, if you haven't already created a team Slack channel, uh, please make one, because I see Umbrella Academy is one of them, but I don't see the other one yet. Invite me to that channel so I can help your team with any questions and discussions you're having. Uh, and that covers it uh, for today. So I'm going to hit uh, stop recording and we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone.